Good evening, everyone. Uh, we are back. Uh, we reconvened the Glendale Successor Agencies meeting. May we have a roll call, please? Council, well, um, do we need a roll call? Not, we do not no? need a roll okay. call. We can just reconvene. Okay. And uh, are we going to open housing and or are we going to close this one on open is there, housing? Is there any reportable action out yeah, of that meeting? There, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council, there's a reportable item on uh, successor agency and also on housing authority. So uh, let's see. I'll give those motions to Mr. <laughs> Najarian because he happens to be sitting next to me. Uh, what am I, Tom Cryer? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mr. Mayor. Uh, or Mr. Chair, uh, no. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. I move uh, that the successor agency council be and is hereby authorized to initiate litigation in a matter on behalf of the successor agency. The name of the action, the other parties to the action, and the nature of the action shall be disclosed to any person upon inquiry once the action has commenced. Is there a, sec is there a second? Yes. Yes. Second. Roll call, please. Agency members Agajanian. Yes. Devine? Yes. Najarian? Yes. Sananian? Yes. Chair Mayor Garpedian? Yes. What's next, please? Motion to adjourn and a second for successor agency. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. We are adjourned. And at this time, I'd like to reconvene the, uh, uh, gen uh, the Glendale Housing Authority meeting. And Mr. Garcia, do you have uh, we have two a reportable report? items, uh, reportable Madam items? Chair? Madam Chair, I move that the city attorney be and hereby is authorized to initiate litigation in a matter on behalf of the housing authority. The name of the action, the other parties to the action, and the nature of the action shall be disclosed to any person upon inquiry once the action has commenced. And do we have a second? So moved. Roll, uh, roll call, please. Authority members Zagajanian? Yes. Garbedian? Yes. Najarian? Yes. Karazian? Yes. Sananian? Yes. Chair Devine? Yes. I have one more item. I move that the city attorney be <coughs> and hereby is authorized to retain the law firm of Burke, Williams, and Sorensen, LLP, to provide legal services. The housing authority executive director is authorized to enter into a retainer with the law firm for a not to exceed amount of $135,000 plus contingency subject to the review and approval as to form by the city attorney. Is there a second? Second. Roll call, please. Authority members Agajanian? Yes. Garpedian? Yes. Najarian? Yes. Razian? Yes. Sananian? Yes. Chair Devine? Yes. Is that it? Thank you. May I, do I have a um, motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Second. We are adjourned. Okay. Um, good evening again, and welcome to the June 13, 2017 Glendale City Council meeting being called to order at 6.20. May, may I have a roll call, please? Council Member Zagajanian? Present. Devine? Here. Najarian? Here. Sananian? Here. Mayor Garpedian? Here. Next is the flag uh, please have your, oh, sorry. Yes. Led by Council salute. Member Devine, followed by the invocation. Please rise. Please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for the invocation. Tomorrow is National Flag Day, a day to honor the flag of our nation and for Americans to reflect on the principles and values that have shaped our common experience and are represented by the tricolored majesty of our star-spangled banner. The American flag has been an enduring symbol of our nation. In 1966, two Montrose residents initiated an effort that culminated in the passage of House Joint Resolution 763, establishing Flag Week and extending this special recognition from simply one day to an entire week of recognition and reflection. Tonight, let us join together and pray for our great nation represented by the flag we all honor. We pray for our community and neighbors to join us in expressing our loyalty to this nation, reaffirming our belief in liberty, equality, and justice, and pray for our nation's unity when faced with forces who would like to see us falter and fail. We pray for those who get up each day to serve this nation in all walks of life, but especially in our armed forces and first responders and public safety. We pray for all this and peace across the world this evening and always. Amen. Thank you. And what's next?
The agenda for the June 13, 2017 regular meeting of the Glendale City Council was posted on Friday, June 9, 2017 on the bulletin board outside City Hall. At 3A under presentation on appointments is agenda preview for the meetings of Tuesday, June 20th, 2017. Mayor Lara Petian, members of the City Council, um, for June 20th for the Glendale Housing Authority, we have no business agenda items. Um, that evening for the Glendale City Council meeting to commence at 6 p.m., we have a few consent items. Director of Community Services and Parks, this is a award of funds received from Los Angeles County and award of funds to the Glendale Youth Alliance as approved and recommended by the Verdugo Workforce Development Board. Director of Public Works, this is regarding miscellaneous transfer drain of 1822. <coughs> Um, we have two action items, Director of Public Works, Citywide Automated Container Replacement Program, as well as Director of Public Works, North San Fernando Landscape Maintenance District. And that concludes my report, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. And what is next, Mr. Here is a proclamation designating uh, amateur radio. <coughs> okay. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, City Council members, I'm Gene Roski. I'm a licensed amateur radio operator, a ham, and a member of the volunteer Glendale Emergency Auxiliary Radio Service, or GEARS. GEARS has a long history of service to the community in disasters and civic <coughs> events, providing radio communications when no other capability exists or when resources need that extension. For example, we support Montrose Parade, Cruise Night, and Verdugo Hills Run, providing public safety radio support during those events. Also here tonight is Larry Cohen, also an amateur radio operator and a member of GEARS, and his wife, Flo Cohen, who is also an amateur radio operator. The Next couple of weeks are very special to amateur radio because June 24th and June 25th are field day. That's when we set up in a location where there is no infrastructure already, in our case, an empty part of Verdugo Park, and do a full 24-hour day of international radio communications to test and prove our ability to do that. We're going to be in Verdugo <coughs> Park on June 24th from 11 o'clock in the morning on Saturday till the next day at 11 o'clock on Sunday doing this and we would welcome the community to come by and see what amateur radio is and how we operate in a park just on solar and battery power to talk around the world. I'm sorry, when is it again? This Saturday? Saturday, June 24th at 11 a.m. through Falling. Sunday, June 25th. Okay. Great, thank you for everything you do. I have a proclamation for you. Uh, it reads, whereas amateur radio has provided emergency communications to our community and to the nation at large when disaster strikes as an integral part of homeland security, and whereas there are currently over 500 amateur radio operators licensed by the Federal Communications Commission within the city of Glendale who are equipped and trained to provide volunteer communication support in the time of need, and whereas Glendale Emergency Auxiliary Radio Services Gears continues to support our community with communications for parades, runs, hikes, and other events, as well as providing emergency backup communications to the city of Glendale. And whereas Crescenta Valley Radio Club provides <coughs> repeaters used uh, by Gears in support of community events and backup communications to the city of Glendale. Now, therefore, I, Vartan Garpetian, mayor of the city of Glendale, do hereby proclaim the week of June 19th through 25th. 2017 as Amateur Radio Week. Thank you very much for recognizing our contribution to the community. Thank you. Uh, what is next, please? Next item on the, on the agenda is Mayor's commendation to Shant Bazikian. Okay, Shant Bazikian. Hello. 
Thank you, Mayor Garpetian and uh, council members for allowing me to speak today and uh, update you on our organization's recent developments. For those of you who don't know, Bikes for Orphans is an organization that my brother and I created four years ago to deliver bicycles to orphans in third world countries so that they can shorten their distance to travel to school. To date, we have been able to raise $50,000 and donate over 270 bicycles to orphans worldwide. However, the reason we are here today is to highlight the fact that for the first time, our focus is on local foster children rather than orphans abroad. We have teamed up with Foster Care Project, an All Saints Church program, and CSUN's Resilient Scholars program to identify 17 foster students that will be awarded a bicycle on June 21st. We have learned so much about LA, LA's foster care system during this process, and we want to highlight some facts and figures with Glendale's residents so that hopefully that some people will be interested in helping the issues that are currently part of the system. Here are some facts that we'd like to share. Currently, there is over $428,000, uh, $428,000 children, uh, foster children in the U.S., and the average age is just nine years old. There are over 76,000 foster children between the ages of 15, seven, 15 to 17, and only 12,400 waiting to be adopted. Just in Los Angeles County alone, there are over 28,000 children, 1,400 awaiting adoptive families, and only 58% will be graduating from high school. The most depressing fact of all is that only 3% will graduate from college, setting up them for failure later on in life. Oh, yeah. CSUN's Resilient Scholar Program uh, mission is to empower foster youth through higher education and helping students to graduate from college. With this event, our goal at Bikes for Orphans is to help these foster students with easier transportation to school and to work, and in the meantime, provide a sense of ownership and pride to these foster students. Our delivery event will take place on June 21st at 3.30 p.m. at CSUN's campus at, in front of the Chicano House, as labeled on the map. Um, we would like to encourage anyone who is interested in coming out and supporting these foster students to come out and support our event. Lastly, we could not have, uh, we'd like to remind everyone that we couldn't do any of this without our generous donors, and that uh, if anyone at home is watching and would like to donate, uh, we have a website, bikesforphans.com, and we have a Facebook, uh, Bikes for Orphans. Um, if anyone is, uh, who wants to donate, they can uh, head over there. And a special thank you to Councilwoman Devine for uh, allowing me to speak today. Thank you for your time and continued support. Okay, uh, welcome, Shant. Um, thank you. For those of you who don't know, Shant is an extraordinary human being. Uh, I've known his parents for over 30 years now, and I'm so proud that my friend's children turned out to be a young, uh, successful men, young men like you are. Thank you. Uh, words cannot describe my feelings tonight. I'm, I'm so appreciative of everything you've done. You, one thing that I want to mention is they uh, delivered over 250 bicycles to orphans in six different continents mm -hmm. or countries, countries, six different countries. And that's a huge task for a young man like you. And uh, that shows your commitment and dedication to human beings as well as your community. So I'm very proud to uh, read the commendation that I'm proudly signed for you. Uh, it says, in recognition of your generous contributions and gracious donations in providing bicycles to the foster children of Los Angeles County, your fundraising campaigns have helped provide a mo mode of transportation for these foster children, allowing them to commute to school and work. On behalf of the city of Glendale, I commend your hard work and wish you continued success in all of your future endeavors. Thank you very much. to say, um, Sean, that, that you give all the parents and, and adults uh, listening and watching this a, a renewed confidence in the youth of our, of our country. And I, I thank you so much for all that you've done for so many. You and your brother having started this, uh, this nonprofit, it's absolutely incredible. And thank you so much. And I know that you are, you are absolutely changing lives. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, and what is next? Adia's Mayor's commendation to Damon's Steakhouse.
Good Mayor evening and Council. welcome. How are you? Doing well, doing well. Rosie. My name is Kevin Beresford, and on behalf of uh, Damon Steakhouse, I'm the general manager here to say thank you for 80 years of steaks and Mai Tais and Chi Chi's and well, actually, uh, for supporting we should, us. We should be thanking you. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's mutual. <laughs> well, our, our success uh, is, is thanks to uh, Glendale, and uh, we hope that uh, we can offer 80 more years of fine steaks, Mai Tais, and Chi Chi's. And uh, yeah, so thank you very much for the commendation. We sincerely appreciate it. Thank you for. Uh, being here tonight, I think 80 years of business is not an easy task, and that sh shows your uh, your business plan. Whatever, whoever wrote your business plan in the beginning, did a great job. It was a good business plan, and you continue their success. Uh, and I wish you many more many more years to come. We have a commendation for you uh, in recognition of Damon's uh, Steaks House 80th anniversary celebra celebration. I truly commend your passion and dedication in providing excellent food and service to our community. On behalf of the city of Glendale, I wish you continued success. Madam. Oh, thank you. Sure. Do we follow Steaks. the wine? Yes. yes. <laughs> thank you, Mayor. What is next, please? Four is uh, consent items, including minutes following a routine and may be acted upon by one motion. A member of council or audience requesting separate consideration may do so by making such a request before a motion is proposed. Uh, is there a motion to move the consent item, the consent calendar? I'll move the consent calendar. Hold on. I'm sorry, I have a question on okay. 4I. Okay, 4I is being pulled. Can we move the rest of the calendar? I'll move the balance. Second. Roll call, please. Council members Agajanian? Yes. Devine? Yes. Najarian? Yes. Sunanian? Yes. Mayor Garpedian? Yes. Can you read the item 4I in the record, please? General Manager of Glendale Water and Power regarding City of Glendale Electrical Easement on the property located at 515 West Broadway and 101 North Kenilworth Avenue. At I-1 is resolution ordering a summary vacation uh, of portions. Okay, Mr. Zern. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, this is what I would refer to as a fairly routine uh, process. Oftentimes we will have utility easements that have been in place for many, many years that are no longer, we are no longer in need of, and we will get requests from time to time, especially if somebody is redeveloping a piece of property uh, if they if they could have that easement if we're no longer using it and that's the case here where we have a couple of pieces of an easement We're retaining a portion of one for continued use uh, Normally these are easements that we did not pay for in the first place that we simply Retained a enough land so that we could have clear access to our facilities in case of emergency or the need to make repairs So with that I will answer any questions. I have a question. Yes, sir uh, did you look into the deed of uh, this land saying that if you don't use it, uh, reverts back or goes back to the property owners? Did we check that? As far as, as the, the original easement for us, did we make that condition on this particular project? If I understand you right, sir, we did not do that. It's our sense that this will be incorporated into the project and will become part of the, should be the land. It should be in the deed that if you don't use it, goes back to original owners. If it's not, then this is like a property you own. Maybe you want to ask the property owners maybe to buy this. That's, I guess that's certainly something we could do as a council. It's not something I have ever done in the past. Usually, as I said, when somebody redevelops a property or properties, and our easements usually when in the redevelopment scenario or the redesign scenario are no, are no longer valid and we aren't using them, we'll simply go through this process of, of, of um, deeding them over to, to the developer of that property. As far as the wording, I, unless Mr. Garcia knows something different, I don't believe that we ever put any reversion yeah. language in there that it would come back to us if, if property changed or if they didn't right. use it. But I'm saying if it says in the easement, there will be in the uh, that document says mm -hmm. that whenever you seize use of that easement, whether what will happen to goes to original property owner or to the street 
or I don't know, what's this back alley there? That's the alley, right. So yes. these are utility easements, a little different right. than if we were to to vacate parts of the street or a, or a public alley. These are just simply unused <coughs> utility easements. To the best of my knowledge, we have never put a reversion clause in, that it simply is when requested by the, the, uh, the developer of the property mm -hmm. that we'll look at it. If it's not something we no longer need or we no longer feel we will need in the future, well, then we will go through this process and, and the land will revert, then go to the, uh, the property owner. Yeah, I, my concern was anyway that if it's not written that you are not using and goes to the property owner, you can ask for money from the property owner. So for the next time, I mean, even not this time, well, I'm, I guess I'm still having trouble following too because the, if the easement is granted to the city, to use if you have that if, if it's going if it's going to go back to them your, your city actually would be giving up a right that it wouldn't necessarily want to give up so that's why they're written open-ended if we need as mr zern stated if it's determined we don't need it if it's a, an owner wants to redevelop or redesign their 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 property and we can relocate it or we don't need it at all then we'll we'll come through this process it's easier than having some automatic right of reverter that we don't necessarily have control over I understand that, but my point was that we have to see that it's written in that easement that when you stop using the easement goes to back back to this property owner. That's what I'm saying. We have to read that. Okay, we'll look at that. Yeah. So it, it, when we use the easement, when GWP uses the easement, when, when we acquire it, is, then we would write something in there. It would be a reversal to the property owner. Right. Is that okay? I'm sorry. But I didn't, this is I, 1922. Yes, and most of must, most of those that you're going to find be, is about that yeah. time period, yeah. because anything that changed, at least in in my short time here in GWP, anything that has been gone through this process has been at least that old. Since this is 1922, maybe it's written differently. So then it's your property, so you can ask for money. I mean, even if it's small money, you can ask for money. That's what I'm trying but to But it's say. not our property. It's, not it, our property. It, it's a use. It, it's a, it gives it, us a, a right to use uh, that person's property. And so when we're vacating, it's going back to that same person. Yeah, I right. understand that. But if it says that in the deed, if it, that should be written in the face of the deed, this is easement for the benefit of Glendale Water and Power. And if you seize the use of it, goes back to the original owner. If this is the property owners, number one, two, three, four, it has written specifically, then goes back to that landowner. But again, mm. we wouldn't, you wouldn't want to give up, you're giving up more rights than you currently have by right. some provision like that in your easement document. And Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I'm not sure I would make that an automatic reversal because it could very well be that while well, we're not using it this minute, we have a plan for it in the future, so we wouldn't want to lose it. In this particular case, we've looked at the future development, we've looked at, at our future build out in that area, and it's a piece of, uh, of access land that we, we no longer mm -hmm. need. And as Mr. Najarian indicated, it's really an access and the ability to make sure we have free and clear access to our, our facilities. The, the truth be known, we don't have our facilities here anymore. We moved them to some other place. So th that's the reason that we no longer need the easement. And if we want to ask for money, we could, but we choose not to. I mean, if, they, if the developer comes to the city and says, if you're not using this easement, why don't you remove it? You know, give it, quit claiming back to the property. And we can say, oh, it's going to cost you $5,000. We, we, we choose not to because we use the property for over 100 years because of our easements, and we're just even reverting it back to the property owner. So, yeah. That's correct, and, and generally speaking, when we acquire those easements, we don't pay for them. So right. they're part of when we put the infrastructure okay. in. Any more questions, Mr. Algeria? No. Thank you. Is there a motion to move the item? For aye? So moved. Is there a second? Yes, second. Roll call, please. Council Member Zagajanian? Yes. Devine? Yes. <coughs> Najarian? Yes. Sananian? Yes. Mayor Garpedian. Yes. What's next, please? Next is City Council and staff comments. Okay. Would like to go first? Well, if no one else will, I will. Um, first of all, I wanted to make comments on the uh, Ciclavia event that we had on Sunday. It was absolutely extraordinary. Um, I have to say that uh, at one point, I, I guess we had 75,000 people. Uh, that was the number that I heard <coughs> in attendance. 
Uh, so that in itself tells you uh, that it was a success as far as numbers, maybe one of the biggest that they've ever had. But um, I did not ride a bicycle, but I did walk the streets and talk to people that were there because I wanted to know exactly how they felt about this event because I had never been to one. I had never really seen one in, you know, on, I've seen just snippets, but never had that experience. And I wanted to know how Glendale uh, measured up to the other Ciclovias. And I talked to people from Long Beach, from Simi Valley, from Diamond Bar, West Covina. They were from everywhere. And I asked all of them the same questions. And these are, these are the um, results of my um, kind of survey. Number one, they said it was the biggest that they've ever had or ever been a part of. Most of them had been to like four, five, one, one couple had been there six times. One couple even gave up a, lot, a Dodgers game. They said they did that once before, but they would never do it again. They were going to come to Ciclovia before they went to see the Dodgers. So it was the biggest one. It was the best organized, the best volunteers, the most polite bikers, and they really appreciated the fact that there were so many families there, and everybody was so courteous to each other. Uh, they said that uh, the Ciclovia uh, staff said that the Glendale staff that they worked with, and that would be Dan Bell and Jackie, that you were fabulous to work with. Uh, they would do it again in a New York minute. Um, and finally, and this was for Rubik, and I don't see him tonight in the audience. Oh, there you are. Okay, Rubik, this is for you, Mr. Galanian. An inline skater who has been to six of these said, we have the best streets that he's ever been on. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I wanted to make sure that I brought that message back to, to everyone. So I just want to congratulate staff and all the volunteers, the police department that was there, fire department was there. I mean, uh, it, was, it was just a terrific event. And uh, I even had someone say, why don't we do this once a month? So, so anyway, we're thinking about what once a quarter. So we're, you know, that's kind of in the works. We're thinking, we're thinking. Um, the second item that I want to uh, talk about is um, I'd like to request a second from my colleagues um, to, uh, I'd like to ask for a staff report uh, or them for staff to prepare a report for a, a uh, program that I'm calling Coins for Care. And what this would be is a program where we would dedicate maybe six to ten and that would have the staff report would come out with that dedicate some of our coin operated parking meters um, to um, different nonprofits every month or every um, or we could do it all together but um, dedicate a part the parking meters in our city so that when you put money in for your parking that money comes back to the nonprofits so in other words you are parking you are paying, and then you are passing it on to a good charity, a good nonprofit. So I'd like to have a, um, uh, a second from my colleagues. Uh, in other words, Essentia might uh, get the profits from those um, parking meters for a month. Uh, YMCA might get them for, or YWCA for a month, Door of Hope for a month. Um, wouldn't be a lot of them, so we wouldn't, we'd be, it would be fair. So they could decorate these parking meters. Uh, kind of make it a fun thing where people would enjoy not only parking but giving. Um, so if I have um, a second from staff, I'd like to uh, ask for this. Um, staff or council? Uh, uh, council, have a council. Uh, so this is to discuss this, right? This to is, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll to second discuss to discuss it. it. To discuss yes. it, yeah. 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 To get it okay. into okay. it. Okay, all righty. Is that it? That's it, thank okay. you. Thank you Anybody very else? much. Uh, sure. Mr. Uh, oh, well, Mr. 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 Um, just a few items uh, to uh, continue with the Ciclavia accolades. I, I did do the biking. I went all the way down to Atwater and came back. And the uh, most, I guess, the most significant remark that I heard was from people who were coming from Atwater Village into Glendale. And they just almost fell off their bikes when they uh, hit the stretch uh, in front of the Americana and making that turn on, on Wilson to go up Brand. They said, wow, this is Glendale? I can't believe it. What a cool city. 
look what they've done. So aside from being fun for the family, I think it's a great economic development tool because I'm sure these people are going to come back and uh, patronize our shops and our restaurants. So it really was a great, I mean, it's not fair to compare ourselves to Atwater Village uh, because we really have invested so much, but it really shined. If you can imagine, uh, you know, it's sort of a, I don't want to get in trouble, but a, a not as fancy uh, stretch of Glendale Avenue where it comes through Atwater Village. And all of a sudden, you know, you dip down the hill, you cross uh, San Fernando, and wow, I mean, these people were really impressed with Glendale. So uh, good job, and maybe we can work on some models to save our costs so it'll be, uh, be possible with our tight budget. Um, in addition, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I have just a few commission nominations that I'd like to make. Uh, I would request, however, that these be brought before uh, the full council. I know we're going to have July a July 11th. I think July 11th is our next full okay. group because I'm going to be gone next week, uh, have a, a pre-planned uh, short vacation. Uh, I'd like this to know. This is the second vacation in a month, Mr. Mayor. I'm just kidding. Short. Um, <laughs> the, uh, my nomination for uh, uh, Parks and Recreation is Ara Kalfayan. For Transportation and Parking, Mauro Yacubian. For uh, Design Review Board, Art Simonian. <coughs> and for Civil Service Commission, Mark McCarley. And I'll have more. I know there's, there's 12 commissions in the city. These are only four. I've got, I'm going to roll these out uh, over the next few uh, meetings, probably through July. Thank okay. you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Council Member. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so, yeah, I, I do also want to join in the, the self-congratulatory comments uh, regarding Ciclavia. It was a great event. We, you know, we planned it for a long time. We, we pursued it. Council, individual council members, council members that are on particular transportation boards and uh, staff and we made it happen. Um, I think we were the 21st, and hopefully we don't have to wait for another 20 before it comes back to Glendale. But it was, it was great, very well organized, very safe, safe for pedestrians as well as cyclists. Um, so kudos to everyone. And let's, I mean, let's just face it, Glendale is a great city. People come to Glendale and, and they like it. They like it, it's a cool place to be. Um, okay, I'm done self-congratulating. Um, I do want to ask for um, a second from council for staff to bring back a report on SB1 and what money we can be looking forward to receiving uh, from that because that's about $55 billion over the next 10 years and uh, you know, it's a lot of money. I want to know what, 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 how much is coming, what's it coming for, how we can use it. Um, and so that's it. Okay. I'll second that. Thank you. And let's bring in, with that motion, let's bring in uh, a Caltrans district director or assistant director to really get into it with them. Yeah. Um, okay. If that's, that's okay. Great. Yeah, that's absolutely. great. Absolutely. Definitely. To have a real good discussion. Mr. Aljanian? I just want to. I, 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 can I, Mr. Aljanian, do you want me to finish? And, oh, I'm yeah, sorry. You were not done. Yeah, no, no, no problem. So, yeah, I also, also wanted to say that I will also not be here next Tuesday. I'm taking my family on our vacation. We plan, you know, I planned that this week based on what the, the city schedule was in January, which didn't foresee us having a meeting. So, again, apologies for not being here on Tuesday, but I'm off on vacation. That was planned months ago. Okay. Are you done, sir? Yes, yeah. thank you, Mr. Mayor. What's our agenda? I would like to announce uh, those who I want to appoint as commissioner. Nicholas Doom for historical preservation for Glendale Water and Power Roland Kedikian, for Art and Culture Commission Arlene Vidor, for uh, Block Grant Advisory Committee Norai Ghazarian, for Status of Women Elena Samergian, and 
audit committee. I may change my mind next week. It will be Vahik Sreturian CPA. Since somebody else came forward, so maybe I jog it around. So you wanna you wanna hold off on that one until you find out, or you yes. wanna keep Vahik Sreturian? Okay. Thank you. Well, Mr. Mayor, let's make sure we, again, as, as mine, let's right, try and put these with a full council. So we this, can. this will come back to us on July 11th. Next time we have a full council. No problem. Okay. Um, I have a couple of items. One is I received a letter regarding a river walk. Uh, there is an area that has a huge cutout for drainage pipe, and apparently there were some issues. There were some uh, homeless, I think, living there when they had some issues when they were using Riverwalk. And I just wanted to bring that up and uh, maybe we can take a look at that. Uh, also, we added few, <coughs> yeah, we added few uh, council meetings to our, uh, to our overall meetings. And I think those are the lighter agenda meetings that we can bring uh, Caltrans director and we can bring other speakers that we want them to come in and, and give us information also, uh, instead of having a, a goal-setting session once a year, uh, some of these, these meetings can be maybe once a quarter. We can bring our ideas up and discuss it at that, at that level and get, get the reports back on that level because we have now six more uh, meetings to, to, to attend. So I think for my colleagues, if you have other ideas that you want to bring to the, to, the, to the council and if you have people that you want them to come in and make a presentation, these are the good good time to do that. Uh, as far as Ciclavia, I had a blast. I, uh, I went to Atwater and came back twice. I rode a bike. I also had a quick ride, what do you call it, that taxi, bike taxi? What's it called? The rickshaw, the rickshaw. No, no. <laughs> no, no. Anyways, I had, I had a little ride in that. It was, it, was, it was great. It was with the AARP people. I want to recognize our, our, our sponsors, City of Glendale, of course, City of LA, Metro. Thank you, Mr. Nigerian. I know you've been very instrumental in bringing Ciclavia to Glendale. Uh, I think Lemley had a big, big uh, sponsorship and AARP. They've done, they've done a great job. I, I heard their commercials every hour on uh, KFI 640, every hour, and it was very, very... Uh, effective. As far as uh, our staff goes, Dan Bell, Jackie Bartlow, and Ivan Guerra. Gu Guerra, sorry, I mispronounced your name. Uh, you guys have done a great job. It was a great event. The music, I don't know who the band was at around 1.30, 2 o'clock in front of Alex. That was, a, that was an awesome band. I, everybody was just having a great time. The food was good. Uh, we had our hubs. The hubs were very, very effective. The hub that Metro had and the second hub, which was food trucks, they are very effective. In the beginning, I was a little concerned about the cross traffic going east-west. We had some of the streets that it was open to the traffic, but the traffic control, they've done a great job. Um, we had no incidents. And of course, Glendale is a great city. It's a premier city. Uh, people come to Glendale and they're, they're, they're wild. So uh, congratulations to all, and hopefully we could have one sooner than later. Can, can so, I just Mr. add Mayor? one thing, one, one observation, Mr. Mayor? Yes, before, About, about the Ciclavia. Uh, yes, yes, go ahead. Uh, but just uh, let's make sure next time we check so that uh, our Ciclavia doesn't coincide with a major regional event. Right. It was, it was Pride uh, Day, you know, protest parade yes, on, on Sunday, and we probably lost, you know, 10, 20,000 potential That's for sure. um, attendees and... and you know, and then we deprived some people of the ability to go there too. So. And I think we have a little video of Ciclavia. I want to.
and also I think we have the, some people from Ciclavia. Good afternoon, Council. I'm Jackie Bartlow. Just wanted to thank you for allowing us to bring Ciclavia to Glendale and approving the budget. Um, I've heard nothing but positive comments. Um, 75,000, not so sure. <laughs> But it was quite a few people out there. We had very few complaints, um, and many people are looking forward to it returning to Glendale. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. I thought Anybody you, else? I thought you were going on vacation, Jackie. One day. All one day. Okay. <laughs> Expecting appliances. Wow. Okay. And also, I'd like to mention Romel Pasquale. He, mm -hmm. he has done a great job in smooth and transition. And I'd like to actually thank my committee. I had an awesome committee. Okay. Uh, Pastor Castanova from Traffic and Transit, um, Dan Bill from Management Services, our police department, they were wonderful. We couldn't have done it without them. Um, public works, like you said, the streets were very well maintained. Um, and then, you know, Ciclavia as well as AAA who did our traffic management plan. It all came together. We had a terrific committee, so thank you again. Great. Thank you. Mr. Yes, Mr. Mr. Mayor, let's, um, and it, that, that was a great video. I think we should all give a shout out to GTV6. Yes, that's right. That's because right. Because they were um, there from the very beginning, our first uh, press conference throughout the day, riding uh, the rickshaw back and forth uh, doing this film. So I know Rob was there and uh, many, many others. So good job, guys. Good job. Good job. As okay. well as volunteers, because each intersection was staffed by a particular company's volunteer who raised the protective tape uh, for the traffic flow. So it was a, really a community event. That's, That's right. great. Okay, thank you. Uh, what is next, please? Next is uh, oral communications. Um, there's uh, two portions, community event announcement portion and a three minute general uh, public comment period, but we have no cards for either. Oh, there's okay. a first time for everything. Yeah, next, please. <laughs> So speak now or forever hold your peace. Uh, seven is adoption of ordinances. Seven A is the ordinance of the City Council amending Title II of the Glendale Municipal Code, 1995, by deleting Section 2.081.130, amending Sections 2.82.100 and 2.82.120, and adding Chapter 2.34, pertaining to the creation of a Department of Innovation, Performance, and Audit. This was introduced by Councilmember Najarian on June 6, 2017. Okay, I'll move the item. Second. I have a small question. Okay. On page, where is the page? Yeah. It says, uh, however, the audit committee shall report its action to the city council at least once annually. Who decides that? Once annually, who decides to report? The finance? I'm, I, no, I'm, I guess I don't understand the question. I mean, you decide it by way of the code. So if you wanted it more frequently, you would change the code to have it a more frequent report. Is that what you mean? But I can ask uh, them to come and report us anytime. I just want to make sure. I would imagine it's council's prerogative, but I think through the established norms, it would be the, the annual report that gets provided. If there's something that's more um, more frequent, you uh, probably would just call on, on uh, Assistant City Manager Beers, and she and Bob Elliott staff the, the group. So, and, uh, and now you'll probably have the Director of In uh, Innovation Performance and Audit. They could come provide that report on an ad hoc basis, I suppose. Okay. Yes, sir. I just want to make sure. Okay. There's a motion on a second roll call, please. Council Member Zagajanian? Yes. Devine? Yes. Majarian? Yes. Sananian? Yes. Mayor Garpedian? Yes. What's next, please? 7B is an ordinance providing for certain officers, subordinate officers, assistants, deputies, clerks, and employees of the City of Glendale establishing an officer position in the City of Glendale entitled Director of Innovation, Performance, and Audit. This was also introduced on June 6, 2017 by Council Member Najarian. I have a quick, I'm sorry. Do you have a question? I was going to move it. Yeah, I have a quick so. question. Uh, this is the, the two positions that we're creating. Is it two positions? How many positions are we creating? Uh, we are creating in this operation the department director and a project manager position um, that we would look to fill. So it would be those two. Right. Two. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Roll call, please. 
Council Member Zagajanian? Yes. Devine? Yes. Najarian? Yes. Solanian? Yes. Eric Garpedian? Yes. Next item, please. Seven C is an ordinance of the City of Glendale, California, amending Title IV, Section 4.52 of the Glendale Municipal Code, 1995, relating to the disposition of city-owned real property for economic development purposes. Introduced on June 6, 2017, by Council Member Sinanian. Any questions? I'll move the okay. item. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Uh, this is, I want to make sure, because city, uh, city manager provided me a section of a charter, the page, uh, and heading, well, however, I was, uh, I was concerned because it says that uh, the property can be sold for, without a bid and for less of what it's value. So he provided me that regardless what, that um, four-fifths of city council members, they have to vote in order to say a property. So that's what I wanted to mention here because So the, you need four votes to lease, sell. sell, to, to, sell. To, to sell. To sell. You need four to votes sell. to sell. Not to lease. Four votes to sell. Yeah, you, okay. need, you need an ordinance to lease property for more than five years, but that could be approved by majority, but you need four votes Got to it. sell. All right. Because that was the concern last week we had. Yes, yes. That uh, why we want to sell it for less than what it's uh, appraised for. Right. So this way, however, the city council, four of them should vote in order to sell the property. Okay. Any more questions? Mr. Najan, would you like, I uh, mean, Mr. Sinanian. Sure, I'll move the item. Okay. Zek. Roll call, please. Council Member Agajanian. Yes. Devine. Yes. Najarian. Yes. Sinanian. Yes. Mayor Karpetian. Yes. Next item, please. Eight would be action items. 8A, police chief regarding project seven lightweight advanced operator packages. 8A1, motion executing agreement with Ardvark Corporation, the amount not to exceed 156,000. Okay, Mr. Uh, yes, so? sir. This is a relatively small purchase, but it comes to you because uh, we are looking to go exclusively with Aardvark as a sole source provider. <coughs> and to give you an idea about uh, what the equipment is and, and why it is selected, uh, the chief will give you a brief overview of the report. Thank you. Uh, tonight, what we're coming to you with is every five years, we need to replace our body armor. So the body armor that officers wear and their uniform capacities has a five-year life cycle with it. Mm -hmm. And the body armor that we provide to our canine officers and our special weapons and tactics officers has that same cycle of life. We are at the end of life on those vests. And you can imagine as technology advances, every five years the vests become lighter and better. And we have found a vest that is uniquely made. It's a proprietary vest sold only by one company that we happen to do a lot of business with because they are usually the low bid for everything else that we buy. And so Lieutenant Jenks, who is a watch commander and the commander of our SWAT team, this is the new vest that we're looking at purchasing that has not only plates, but the body armor, and I won't go into proprietary details for safety reasons. And it's significantly lighter than the old vest and after five years, which puts less strain on the officer's bodies, less injuries as they're climbing over walls and do dirty things with it. This is the old vest that he has down here and we were having some of the members of our staff lifting up, and it's a significant weight difference that wow. we're going to do. So it's $156,000 to buy all the vests for SWAT and canines, and we take it out of our asset forfeiture so it does not have any impact on the general fund. It's, a, it's an approved use of, of asset forfeiture funds to buy this unique safety equipment, and we are asking for your approval tonight to allow us to buy from Aardvark and if you have any other questions about the use or this staff report, Lieutenant Jenks would be happy to answer those questions for you. Go ahead, Mr. Mr. Sinani. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Bob would want to try one, did I hear that? <laughs> <laughs> Chief, how many vests is that? 156, you said it's enough for SWAT and uh, canine? How it's many? a total of 27 vests, which would cover all of our SWAT operators and our canine operators as well. And it takes every level of ballistic plate? Uh, correct. It has a ballistic plate inside oh, the vest, inside, right. okay. um, which which would protect against, uh, for example, a, a rifle round. And the, the package also includes a helmet and a and a ballistic gun belt as oh. well. So there's it, there's a complete package that, that goes with it. Okay. 
That's it. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Council Member Alexander, and then Council Member Dubai. Right. Let's see. 28, I guess. 26 or 28? 28 stays here anyway. But my question. I could be wrong. Says, I don't remember yeah, if it was 27 or 28. It says 28. It could be 28. But how much it weighs, the new one? Do you know? I don't have a, a, an exact number, but but I would estimate the new one's probably about 20 pounds. It's not light either, but compared to the old one, it's significantly lighter. Yeah. But it's more effective, you say? It, it, it uh, provides the same level of protection as our same old vest, but it's much more maneuverable. It's much, uh, it's more breathable. It's lighter, which would hopefully contribute to less injuries of our mm -hmm. operators and uh, our canines. Thank you. I just have one, one question. You called it proprietary equipment that's in the, does this lighter vest um, have enough, uh, as, as many places for proprietary equipment as, because the other one looks like it has all sorts of pouches and. Yes, uh, th this vest as well will, will take as many pouches as the operator wants and a lot of that's left up to the individual officer on what gear they want to take. Uh, the old vest I have here does have a few different pockets on it uh, because it's it's a it's a vest of one of our current operators. Okay. Okay. I know they're awfully heavy, very heavy. Because I think we we had the experience of putting those on. Remember when we did yeah. the boot the boot camp? A boot, yeah. Work boot. Yeah. Yeah, and this is just the vest alone, not including you know all of the other equipment that the officers have to carry with them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'll is there a motion? Item. I'll second it. Roll call, please. Thank you, Chief. Council Member Agajanian? Yes. Devine? Yes. Najarian? Yes. Sinanian? Yes. Mayor Carpetian? Yes. Next item, please. Next item would be 8B, General Manager of GWP, regarding award of contract for the sale for the Power, Power Island major equipment and services for the proposed biogas renewable generation project to convert the landfill gas to energy and the issuance of a limited notice to proceed with two Western Energy Systems, a division of Penn Detroit Diesel Allison LLC, and approval of alternative project delivery method for the proposed power project. One, resolution to execute a contract with Western Energy Systems, a division of Penn Detroit Diesel Allison LLC for the sale of Power Island major equipment and services for the proposed biogas renewable generation project in the amount of 14 million 151,366 and authorizing the issuance of a limited notice to proceed in the amount of $222,428 plus a 15 percent contingency of 33,364 to provide design and engineering deliverableness necessary for permitting development of specifications and analysis under the California Environmental Quality Act. Two, resolution authorizing the city manager or his designee to use the engineer procure EPC construct alternative project delivery method for the proposed biogas renewable generation project and authorizing the issuance of a request for qualifications and a request for proposal to prospective EPC contractors. Three, resolution of appropriation transferring the sum of 255792 from the electric fund net position account number 5532790 to the Grayson Power Plant Project account number 5539211374 Okay, Mr. Ocha. Yes, sir. Uh, oh, Mr. Mayor. Yes, yeah, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> okay. I, I, um, there's a conflict I, of interest? Yeah, I have to uh, recuse myself because there is a conflict of interest because of uh, uh, holdings that uh, I have in the or my husband and I have in the GE company. Okay. Yes, and Mr. Mayor, I also uh, state law requires state conflict of interest laws require me also to recuse myself from consideration due to my holdings uh, in the uh, General Electric Company whose equipment is proposed to be used okay. by one of the... Thank call, you. Call us when you're done. No problem. So with that, sir, uh, we'll have Steve uh, Zerner, General Manager, come forward, talk about uh, the procurement process that we've gone through. You've heard the term LNTP, Limited Notice to Proceed, and that's a method uh, that we are utilizing uh, considering the, uh, the complexity of this procurement as well as its cost. 
um, and you'll hear the uh, alternative uh, delivery method, the EPC, again reflecting the uh, complexity of this. But ultimately, it all fits into the integrated uh, resource plan that the City Council has reviewed uh, and, and has adopted as a means of recognizing that we have uh, the methane gas, uh, that we need to burn that methane gas from the, the Shoal Canyon landfill. We're gonna have it for a generation, and it is actually more environmentally friendly uh, to burn it on site and use it to generate electricity as opposed to trying to transport it or pipe it uh, to another location. So with that, Steve will uh, walk you through the procurement. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, that, that summed it up pretty well right there. Um, <clears throat> it's awesome. Um, what we have back in, as Mr. Ochoa indicated, uh, from the integrated resource plan, we, we decided to, to separate the landfill gas or the biogas project as a distinct and separate project from, uh, from the proposed Grayson Repower. There's a number of reasons for that. One, we've had a, a biogas project in place since 1992. 25 years later, it's at the end of its useful life, the equipment needs to be replaced. And also in that 25 years, technology, environmental uh, improvements, and state mandates have all changed the way that we look at how we process uh, that particularly na naturally occurring uh, landfill gas, which is primarily methane. And for those uh, who, who are familiar, methane is one of the most harmful constituents when it comes to global warming. And it's one of the ones that's at the top of the list to, to deal with. As Mr. Ochoa indicated, it occurs naturally. It will continue to occur for 20 to 30 years beyond the closure of the landfill even. Uh, so it's something that we needed to, to address. At the same time, the opportunity provided itself for us to utilize that in a more efficient manner to produce renewable energy. Uh, and that's something that we're also required to do under state law. Currently, we have to meet the mandate of 50% renewable portfolio by 2030. So this is a large project in our portfolio. The current project that I've mentioned before, the one that was uh, originally done in 1992, involves collecting the gas at the landfill, compressing it in, in large equipment at the site, and putting it into a five and a half mile pipeline that goes down to Grayson. Uh, that gas there is very low quality. So in order to make it uh, viable to burn in our units, we have to mix it with about 50% natural gas. That means only half of that gas is renewable energy. It's b currently burnt in the large traditional electrical processing facilities, power generating facilities. It is not, those facilities were not made to burn this kind of gas. It's extremely corrosive, it's extremely harmful, and it has a quite a bit, when it mixes with the natural gas and goes into that natural environment, has a carbon emissions issue. By separating the project, putting it at the landfill, using specially designed equipment, we create a totally different project. We create a project that is A, 100% renewable. So we will, we will be able to claim 100% of that landfill uh, gas or biogas as, a, as an electrical production fuel. Uh, this will provide us about 12 megawatts of electricity at the site. It is considered to be a, a carbon reduction process because not only does it take the methane and destroy it in the process of generating electricity, that process does create a small amount of carbon. It, it actually destroys the methane, destroys the, the volatile organic compounds, and creates carbon dioxide, a, a small amount, water, and some other constituents. But this type of a project is considered to be a carbon reduction, overall carbon reduction program. And I'm, I'm struggling a sec as I try to remember what the Federal Environmental Protection Agency has used as a comparison. Now, 2016 statistics for our project that we're proposing would reduce carbon equal to, on an annual basis, equal to carbon produced by 66 million gallons of gasoline. It also would in, uh, equal the carbon sequestration, which is the green trees that, that absorb the carbon, turn it into food and cellulose through photosynthesis. There's obviously not enough trees in the world to deal with the carbon that's coming out now. But the, this project, our project alone on an annual basis, is equal to the carbon sequestration of 550,000 acres of forested land. So it's a very significant project. This brings energy to about 7,200 homes in, in Glendale. Uh, it provides us, uh, from the, in the eyes of the AQMD, the Air Quality Management District, a project that does not require any carbon emissions credits because it's considered a beneficial public use 
by having it at the landfill, generating the electricity at the landfill, putting it back into the grid. That's a big issue here. As, as you may recall, when I came to you back in May uh, to start this process, the cost to continue to burn it at Grayson would be somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to $35 million just for the emissions credits. So this whole project, the engineer's estimate is $30 million. It would have been double that just in the carbon emissions credits if we were to continue to burn it the way we are burning it today. So this project gets us 100% renewable. It has a significant carbon reduction. It takes care of the naturally occurring methane, again, a, a significant factor to global warming. Um, and it, it keeps us well on, our, on the way to meeting our renewable portfolio standard and the state mandates. Uh, it's, a, it's a good overall project. We also, another ancillary benefit is we eliminate the five and a half mile pipeline that currently is in place. That's a pipeline that does requ would require some upgrades, but that pipeline can be replaced and that runs through neighborhoods, traver traverses from the landfill to the power plant and runs through neighborhoods. So the ability to eliminate that and any gas in that pipeline is a plus, at least in my opinion, and I think in most people's opinion. So this is a very, very positive project. You can see that we took uh, proposals. Uh, we, we received three firms that proposed, uh, DCO, Quinn Power Systems, and, and WES. Uh, you'll notice that one had a, what's called the prime mover, just to explain that, it says solar turbine. The other two were uh, the brand names of the reciprocating engines. I just want to, for clarification, that solar turbine, that is not a solar, sun solar turbine. It's just the name of the turbine. Uh, it's a gas-fired turbine. It's a Caterpillar-owned company. They make three products, gas-fired turbine, gas-fired compressor, and a gas-fired compressor turbine. So it, it has nothing to do with solar. It's also the most inefficient technology out there now. It's kind of a fading technology. The reciprocating <coughs> engines are obviously where you want to go. And you can see in our chart that we had on page three, that, that the cost uh, per kilowatt hour is the lowest, the, the power production is the highest. So we are recommending to you tonight to go with, with WES and the Yenbacher engines. We're also asking to uh, proceed with issuing RFQs through the uh, EPC process for the, for the potential construction of this. It's the same process we followed for the Grayson Repower. It is the industry standard for building power plants. Uh, the EPC stands for Engineering, Procurement, and Construction. It's somewhat of a turnkey type of a, of a contract, uh, but it's different from our standard uh, specification kind of bid-build project, so we, so we have to have a, uh, uh, it on the agenda tonight, and we'll issue RFQs. There's no commitment on the RFQs, financial or otherwise. We will take it, that out and see what kind of firms come back, and we will eventually be back to you uh, with all of this bundled. Certainly we have some financial information that we're gonna provide you early next year. Hopefully I'll be back January to go through the numbers. And then in May of 2018 is when we make decisions on going forward with all of these various projects. So with that, uh, I will be happy to answer any questions. So I'm trying to understand. So you want to have Western Energy Systems to contract with them for like 222,000, 420 plus 15 percent contingency of 33,000, right? So let me, Mr. Agajeni, and that's a great point. Let me explain that for a minute because Mr. Mr. Ochoa hit on it. We've got what we call limited notice to proceed and a final notice to proceed. The limited notice to proceed is what I'm asking for tonight. That simply begins the process. It selects the firm. That firm then takes and goes in and starts the permitting and environmental process. There is no commitment to buy the product. We still haven't made that commitment. You still haven't made that commitment. Okay. The $220,000 is the fee they charge to go through the permitting process and do the work to, cut, to get to this end. You may recall with the, the large power island equipment uh, at Grayson, it was more in the neighborhood of $3 million. So it's relative based on the type of equipment. So that's the only financial commitment we have at this point. The final cost is 14 million, but you won't approve that until you decide on the final notice to proceed, which okay. will be next May. So because the way it has been written here, all of a sudden uh, you are comparing to have, I think that's why they left the room, because if they would know probably it's just the contractor you were taking for 222,000, that has not to do with 
purchasing and equipment, so they didn't have conflict of interest. I'll let Mr. Garcia speak to that. Uh, me members of council, Mr. Mayor, um, we, we advised uh, the two council members that they, they did have conflict because this is the first step in the process could, that could ultimately le lead to a purchase of equipment uh, owned by GE or, or manufactured by G a GE subsidiary. It is a conflict, um, and that's why they were required to uh, recuse themselves. But where it says that you're buying something from GE, this the, Western the, Energy System. So let me explain that, Mr. Agajanian. Western Energy System is a contracting firm. They're also right. the sole distributor for General Electric. The okay. company next to it, Yenbacher, right. is an Austrian-owned company that's wholly owned by General Electric. General Electric owns the companies. First one? So DCO. that's a Caterpillar company. Okay. That's a contractor. The solar turbine is a Caterpillar country. The second is Quinn Power. But that's at a this time, you're not buying from General Electric. Well, we're making a financial commitment. And you're making a decision that could ultimately lead to the purchase of equipment owned by GE. And that's at any time no. you're, at when any you time. When you say GE, there are three companies here that has not been decided whom we're going to buy. Although the way it has been written, Western Energy System, it provides net output of 10,800 kilowatts. Correct. Correct. But Mr. Zern is recommending to yeah. you that we do the limited notes to proceed with um, uh, What's it called? Western, w Energy, Western Energy, Energy Systems. So WS, their, first their, first their equipment provider is a company wholly owned by GE. So but that's we are not buying that. Well, no, but, but I'm requesting that we continue with them. So everybody else is at this point eliminated. They'll be notified that they're eliminated. The process is now down to just this firm. Now, at the end of the day, you still have the opportunity to say yay or nay whether we go forward. And that means the whole thing will be done. But at this point in time, we are eliminating the other two and going wholly with WES uh, and, and Yenbacher. Okay, you are hiring this company, Western Energy Systems, and don't, they are not involved with what you buy will be the best? They are not involved with purchasing the equipment, right? They are, they are the distributor of the equipment. They are a firm, because this equipment requires not only uh, simply the equipment, it requires uh, a number of control uh, apparatus that have to be installed with it. So it's been bid through a contract company. That contract company that we're recommending is, again, the, the sole distributor of General Electric products. But however, at this time, we are taking Western Energy Systems, which the contract amount is 222000 That's the commitment we have at this point, yes. All right. And, the, and their final bid of $14 million is firm. So if you decide to issue the limited notice to proceed later, that $14 million negotiated price is what they will stand by. Sorry, again. No, not at all. Please, of course. Take your time. But usually when you would come forward, you would not bring an equipment that we are not deciding anything about it. And I mean, this comparison is when you buy something. I mean, this is... So maybe I can help. The, the idea is that these are such large procurements and the, the process to, uh, to uh, buy them, permit them, construct them, and then ultimately turn the keys over is such that, and they take such a long time to get through that process, that the city council, we want to uh, effectively uh, give something of a deposit, that we would put the, the, the money forward for the recommended equipment, knowing that you don't have to make the final decision as yet, but you do have to put up earnest money in the form of this uh, $222,000. If the city council decided for whatever reason, um, before we have to issue the, the final notice, you can pull the plug and you don't have to pay the 14 million, but you will be at the $200,000. Now, if you ultimately, as Mr. Zern says, if, if we feel good about the project and the project moves forward, well then you will issue the final notice at some point in the future, less the deposit effectively that you're making at this point in time. Now, I have another question then. Here it says on the page, I mean, anyway, it says to provide design, yes. engineering de uh, deliverables mm -hmm. necessary for permitting, development of specification. When you want to develop a specification, it means then you say what I need, not from the beginning you come and say, okay, this is the equipment I want, then I go hire Western Energy Services systems, and then I hire them for 
$250,000 and they are uh, develop, uh, they develop the specifications. It should be the other way. So Mr. Mayor, Council Member Agajani, and let me see if I can, I can help. And as Mr. Ochoa said, this is not a, anywhere near a traditional system. You, you will not see anything like this again. This is a once in a lifetime uh, situation. We also broke this into many small parts to give council ample opportunity to review each subsection versus coming to you with one large project and saying, here it is, whatever millions of dollars it is, you say yes now and we're on our way. Instead, we broke it up into these pieces. So in this particular case, to specifically answer the last question you had, we, this firm has to come up with, they make a lot of different equipment. We, gave, we put out an RFP that said we want reciprocating engines that produce this amount of, of kilowattage that run on landfill gas, that will run 100% on landfill gas, that have these kind of, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing because, you know, these RFPs. And so you have a general scope of work that you want. It has to meet our air quality standards. Once we award the limited notice to proceed, to proceed now we want them to give us a detailed circuit by circuit specification on the product so that our electrical engineers, our consultants, and our mechanical engineers can do every single part. We haven't done that yet because we don't need to. We haven't made the recommendation to move forward on the final product. So they will go through literally turning page by page at every circuit. And at the same time, all of the other information that they must put together to submit to the AQMD for their permits or any other regulatory body, that's on them. They have to do that, and that's what's included in their $222,000 price tag for this particular phase of it. Obviously, if we decide to move forward and purchase this, ultimately, the 222 is part of the overall 14. So that, that's how we're doing that. They, you know, it, to break it up like this, um, we're making a, a, a two-phase commitment, if you will, but, but there is some level of, of, of work that they do and some level of commitment they make, and we agree, again, we negotiated this number, but we agree that this is a fair number for them to do all of the preliminary work that they need to do to get their permit. If they're unable to get their permit, I'm coming back to you and saying, we're not buying this equipment, that's for sure. We're not moving any, any more forward with, with that. I'm sorry, I have to comment again. Uh, see. The private companies, they go and hire a consultant. Say, this is what our requirements are. And they put up together specifications. They say, okay, you need whatever you wrote here. Uh, net output, I want like approximately 10,000 uh, kilowatt. And I want to see what the cost per kilowatt will be and what kind of equipment I buy to be most efficient. Uh, now, the way I understand it, this Western energy system somehow is related with Western energy uh, that they sell also the equipment. I'm going to them and saying, okay, give me any specification. So I'm gonna write the specification such that only my equipment will fit to your requirement. But you're picking them now. We're picking them now. You're picking them now. <laughs> it isn't as though. It isn't as though contract. Yeah. Well, it isn't as though you're not going to to have Western uh, WES come in and devise a spec for somebody else to bid on. They're coming in and aligning uh, and and confirming all the specifications, as Mr. Zern indicates, for this site, for this project, for this configuration, with this permit to burn this gas at that facility, uh, so that it'll generate the specified amount of energy. And, and so we, product. it is a GE product. So, right. so when so you actually getting. do the, the final notice to proceed, it's going to be with the same people. It isn't. <laughs> it don't. Let's be real clear. It isn't as though that these guys are going to they're going to create a spec that somebody else is going to bid on. They're selling you a GE uh, Jambacher turbine. That's what that is what and this so whole thing is. So then I'm committing myself now. If I take this contract of two hundred fifty thousand dollars. I'm committing to my, myself to a future purchase of $14 million equipment. No, you're not. 
you are are well no you, you are, are doing this but the whole point of the LNTP versus the final notice to proceed is that you're specifically not committing yourself you're committing yourself to two hundred and twenty two thousand dollars four hundred twenty eight plus a contingency which may or may not be spent of thirty three thousand if for some reason somewhere in this process you decide I don't want to go forward you're out the 222 you're not out the 14 million so you specifically are not committing yourself so to 14 now if you decide that you do want to continue moving forward you've already negotiated that price so later on WES can't say hmm you're wedded to me I've devised the spec I have a permit I have the location I'm gonna jack the price on you because I can because you can't you can't go anywhere else you've already spent two hundred twenty two thousand dollars with me Mr. Zerns already locked in the price at 14 million said no 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 a year ago you locked in at 14 we are that's what the, the whole purpose of this procurement to this date is to say did we want to go with a with Quinn power which gives you a caterpillar with the DCO uh, which is the other one or the, the Gen Bocker. so you're, you're making that choice now and then we'll move forward down that line can I offer something Mr. Uh, Virginian I think the only thing we're committing to at this point is that if if the whole design engineering uh, permitting process and the de development of specifications process works out we are committing to buying the GE product but that doesn't mean that we will buy it it just means that we don't if buy it works now. out not so, so, so we're not committing to buying anything we're committing no. to if, if it all works out and we decide to move forward, it will be the GE product. Right. I think that's the only thing we're committing to. But I mean, in private, you just come up uh, with a company consultant who gives you all the ideas and then people, they come and bid on it. I, you say, this is the specification. I think you went through and that, and that's why it's. And, and I think, Mr. Mayor, Council Mayor Agajanian, that's a process, you know, 31 years, a lot of it in public works, a lot of it in water power, that is the, the norm. As I said, this is, this is something you're gonna not see uh, very often, if ever. But I will tell you this, this is pretty much the norm in the power plant building business. Okay. Um, whether you're public or private. Uh, if you look at our friends at Edison and PG&E, they go through similar processes in order to vet their folks. Maybe not as detailed as this, but again, we wanted to be as detailed as possible to make sure that the council right. had every opportunity to review and approve each step. So I hope Thank I was you. able to help. Okay, a uh, couple of quick questions. The RFP and RFQ is for? The RF, the rep, uh, Mr. Mayor, the request for proposal will go out for what we call the EPC contractors. This is the firm that will come in, they will take whatever equipment you approve, again, if you approve them, and they will build the entire site. So they'll do the civil engineering, the electrical work, so the, the building plumbing. portion of it. Yes. Okay, and uh, can you repeat your statement about it, it's going to power 7,500 homes and 550,000 acres of forest. Uh, so, Mr. Mayor, the uh, and this is according to the federal EPA, who has a separate what they call a, a landfill methane outreach program. So they track this pretty well. So, uh, using 2016 statistics, and this is a national average. A, pr a project our size powers about 7,200 homes. That may vary depending on where you are in the country. But that's pretty pretty standard, and even if you look at the kilowatts, I really excuse me, the megawatts, that's about right. So this project, 7,200 homes, the carbon that we would avoid by by using the the, the gas that generate the biogas at the landfill, burning it in these engines, is an offset. In other words, we would eliminate the same amount of carbon equal to what would be carbon uh, sequestration for 550,000 acres of forested land. How big of a facility would this be? It's about an acre and a half total, which includes all of the ancillary, the control rooms. Um, the, in this particular case, we've got four units, so they'll sit uh, one side by side. They're relatively low, low level or low lying, um, and there'll be buildings and stuff for noise attenuation. But it's at the, the site where we currently have the flares and the, uh, the compression system at the landfill. And so there'll be just a, a little bit bigger area that we, we blade off and put it right there. And this has nothing to do with extending the life of Absolutely the landfill. Absolutely not. You need this facility, even if the landfill is closed tomorrow or in two years, to burn the gas. Correct. Mr. Mayor, this was sized and, and detailed strictly on the current permitting capacity of the landfill. No expansion. Okay. One more question. Yes, sir. The people who live 
around the land field, they know that you are doing something yes, that sir. will be in their benefit? Uh, yes, sir. Well, more Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Agadani, and th they operate the landfill for us under a contract, but they absolutely are responsible for all the environmental controls. So these projects are very important to them as well, and we coordinate all of these efforts with them. Okay. okay. Any more questions? <clears throat> no. Thank you. Is there a motion? Yes. Um, so w w hold on. What are we moving? Uh, which items? Uh, it's B123. All of them. So all of them together. Okay, Mr. Agachini, were you moving it? Is that what you said? Okay. Um, and I, I want to second it, and, and before I second it, I, I just want to, I didn't really say anything because I think all the questions got asked. Um, this is a very good project. This is very good for Glendale. It's good for the neighborhood because all this methane that would otherwise go into the atmosphere or be just be flared, which means really wasted, wasted. Methane is going to be wasted. It's not a perfect process. All it does is throw off carbon into the atmosphere. A lot of that is going to be eliminated, so this is great. We're going to generate electricity, get rid of the um, methane without creating uh, carbon emissions uh, into the atmosphere. So I'm going to second it. Okay. Mr. Roll call, please. Council Member Zagajanian? Yes. Devine? Najarian? <coughs> Sananian? Yes. Mayor Garpedian? Yes. Thank What's you. next, please? Next item on the agenda. At C is Director of Finance regarding annual Glendale Water and Power Transfer, C1's resolution reducing the percentage of operating revenues to be transferred from Glendale Water and Power to the Glendale Reserve Fund for fiscal year 2016-17. Yes, Mr. Ocha. All right, we have the rather nuanced manner in which we are required by our charter to uh, make the electric uh, transfer. Uh, microphone, please. Uh, the electric fund transfer, uh, as laid out in the city charter, uh, as you see on the screen. Um, the manner in which that we do this is, as I say, rather nuanced. Certainly it wouldn't be the, the same way that we do any of our other enterprise funds, but none of our other enterprise funds are contained in the charter. Uh, the charter does allow, in fact, it mandates the transfer uh, to uh, certain specifications, and it's probably worth noting again that the transfer people talk about, uh, we just want to have uh, the voters vote on the general fund transfer. The voters did indeed vote on it back in 1941, 1946. They've been in place ever since. Now the transfer, uh, the, the general fund transfer is allowed to exist up to a maximum of 25% of revenues for the electric utility. Uh, I can tell you that it was as high as, at least in terms of, of my tenure here, 14%. Uh, we made a conscious choice to knock that number down over a period of years to 10%. So at this point, uh, we have finally locked in at that 10% of electric revenues far below the 25% that's allowed and even called out by the charter for a total of $20.1 million. Um, here you see by the 2012-2013 year as opposed to the 11-12 year that I was referring to, <coughs> referring to previously, uh, it was at as high as 12.7%, uh, knocked down again uh, to the tune of several hundred thousand dollars a year in a very conscious manner, conscious manner uh, so that in the 16-17 year, um, we make the transfer at the end of the fiscal year, uh, that number is locked in at that 10% number, $20.156 million. Um, people ask, okay, well, how does this actually work? This flow chart kind of explains um, the way that the charter calls out the transfer uh, mechanics, and again, not the way that you would do it for any other enterprise fund. And as you note on the bottom, this is not compliant uh, with generally accepted accounting principles, but again, this is a function of our charter. Um, you see that the revenue uh, funds exist there at 552, 556, 557. You recall from your previous budget meetings where we talked about the various enterprise funds uh, that the uh, GWP uh, electric utility operates. Um, those dollars, after we close those out, those dollars flow into the electric works surplus fund, fund 550, uh, and then make their way to the general reserve fund, fund 102. You see there a decision box that says if the general fund reserve balance prior to the electric transfer exceeds 50% of the total amount of the anticipated ad valorem tax receipts for the current fiscal year, meaning the property tax receipts, uh, then money can flow to the general fund, fund 101. 
The reason why I believe that you have that test there is because, again, the business plan of the city back in the uh, growth period, uh, pre-war, and certainly as you head into the post-war when the voters approved this measure, is to make sure that the city is indeed growing. One of the measures of growth for the city is, in fact, its property, uh, assessed property values as manifest by a property tax. So if the city fathers and mothers at that point, uh, we're not moving to grow the city and grow the tax base. The uh, framers of our charter uh, had the inclination not to allow them to simply uh, create what would be a, a very large, with no disrespect to our friends in Vernon, a very large Vernon, uh, a city that had a significant amount of uh, usage of utility uh, that would generate lots of revenue, but that wasn't really building a city. And here in Glendale, obviously, our, uh, the ad valorem uh, tax is a significant portion of the general fund, but by no means is it the majority of the general fund. So uh, we do make that, the, we are allowed to make that transfer, we make that transfer, uh, and then move it the, from one, uh, Fund 101 uh, back to General Fund, Fund 102. So it leaves uh, uh, the uh, utility, moves through its surplus funds into the general fund, out of the general refer, uh, reserve fund, and then ultimately uh, goes back to that general re reserve fund. So uh, in any event, that's how we do it. Uh, what we are recommending to you at this point in time is that uh, the council approve the annual GFT, uh, and you will see how it fits into the overall budget in the coming presentation with that. Mr. Elliott uh, and certainly Mr. Garcia can answer any question that you may have. Okay, um, I do have a question. The amount, the percentage goes down from 2012-13 to this year to 10%, from 12.7 to 10%. Yes, sir. Uh, but the amount is pretty much the same because our revenues grow? Yes, sir. Is that what it is? So it's a percentage of revenue. Council, previous council has, has given the direction to drive the percentage of revenue down such that the, the GFT really can't drive and shouldn't drive revenue growth. Uh, and that's, uh, I think that's reflected here where you see that the change uh, from one year to the next is, uh, is $47,000 uh, between uh, 15, 16, 16, 17. Okay, I have a speaker card. Uh, let me go to, the, to Mr. Frank Gallo. Gallo? Gallo. Oh, yeah. Sorry. It's been a long day. Thank you, Mr. Barton. My name is Frank Gallo, and I have a very specific question for you, Mr. Ochoa. What amount of money is being put aside for depreciation? Because the city charter expressly states that the city has to put money aside for depreciation before the transfer is done both for the water revenue fund and for the electric revenue fund. So what amount of money is being put aside before you do the transfer? Mr. Mayor, would you like to get through all the comment and then we can address any questions he may have as we go forward? Yes, if you, if you would like to finish your, your, your comments and then um, we'll go. The, the charter specifically states that before any money is transferred to the uh, general reserve fund, you have to put money aside for, for depreciation. Uh, I am part of the Glendale Coalition for Better Government. As, as you know, we are very concerned with that because we have seen that in the past money has been transferred without being money put aside for depreciation. So what amount of money are you putting aside for depreciation for the electric and the water fund in, in this case? Then perhaps as we answer council questions, you recall from, I believe it was the, Thank you, the budget hearing as well as I think budget study session number three where we went through all funds, we showed the depreciation funds. Um, we could talk about the water depreciation fund, basically those capital investment funds uh, for the two utilities, although I think the contention with respect to the general fund transfer really doesn't involve water because the city hasn't transferred water revenues pursuant to the charter since I believe 2011. So while we can get that for you, if there's any other questions, uh, we can uh, address those now. And if not, we'll just have the finance staff pull that because, as I say, it was part of the budget presentations previously. 
And I think the contention, obviously, is that we're not putting money into depreciation. I think when you look at the investment that's gone in, um, including up to and including one of the uh, items that was on consent tonight for a slope repair and replacement of reservoirs, city continues to have a rather robust uh, replacement program and infrastructure uh, program. So I, I think that, uh, once again, one of the items that uh, that gets mischaracterized is that the city doesn't put money into the infrastructure, quite the contrary, uh, particularly when you look at the, uh, the two bonds that were sold uh, over the last several years, both for electric and water, you've had a very significant investment in, uh, in the depreciation of the utility. Okay, any comments or questions? Is there a motion? I'll move the items at 8C1. I'll second. Roll call, please. Council Member Zagajanian? No. Devine? Yes. Najarian? Yes. Sananian? Yes. Mayor Garpedian? Yes. Next item, please. He is Director of Finance regarding GAN appropriation limit. D1 is resolution adopting 2017 2018 GAN appropriations limit. Um, very quickly, sir, because this is one of those annual steps that we have to take by way of the budget. Um, uh, in the wake of Prop 13, uh, the other bill that was moved forward by Mr. Paul Gann uh, effectively sets an appropriations limit for cities known as Prop 4 or the Gann Initiative. And what that was was basically a, a spending ceiling, an appropriation ceiling for uh, public entities. I can tell you that in 24 years working for cities, I have never come close to what the GAN limit would ultimately allow as it uh, stipulates that there is a ratio for uh, income and uh, uh, population growth and through there uh, the, uh, the GAN limit, the, the ceiling if you will on appropriations is established. Uh, once again, here in the city of Glendale, we are far below what that GAN limit is. Uh, there is a function of uh, the budget that is allowed uh, under the, uh, the GAN limit. I, this year, our fiscal year is 17-18 limit is $266 million. Uh, the uh, appropriation that are subject to GAN is about $167 million. So we're about $98.7 million under the limit. I'll move 8D1. I have a question. Okay. Uh, you picked up, in order to calculate this GAN limit, the change in California per capita personal income and pop Glendale population for the period of January 2016 to January 2017. But there was the criteria to calculate are also gives you other options. Have we calculated based on the other options? We calculate the GAN limit just based on the, the growth, um, both for population and per capita growth on, on the economics. So we've done it basically that same way for this entire time. I said, but on the other way that it asked to calculate, we didn't do it. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, typically what you do is you look at the different calculation methods and, and do the one that's most beneficial um, to raise the ceiling as high as you as you can so you have that um, so you make sure you're under that appropriation limit um, this type of calculation the one we do is the one that's most beneficial um, to our city where we take the population growth um, and, and do the calculation based on that so yes we do look at that and, and additionally we also have our external auditors um, review this calculation. No, the way you calculated, it's perfect. It's 166 million versus that you could spend or collect taxes, 266 million. That's very good. I have no objection to it. I'm just saying the GAN and other pertaining laws give you to calculate the same thing some other ways. Correct. But we haven't done to see if we still are within the, that limit. We didn't do calculation. You, you we choo just choose yeah. to do you, this. You choose the way, the, in my entire career, when you have, when we've done this calculation, you choose the one that raises that ceiling high, higher. So when we do those different calculations, this, t this version of the calculation has always been the most beneficial. 
So we, it's something we do look at, but we also want to raise that fiscal um, limit as high as we can. All right. So, so the answer to this question is yes. Yes. No. no. The answer to my question is no. We no. We do look at the other calculation. We we use this one because it's more it's beneficial. Right. No, I understand. You use this method to do it, and we are within the limit, lower than limit. Correct. But. The law provides that you can calculate differently. Correct. We it, didn't do that one. We don't have in front no, of us. I think us. the answer is that, that we do calculate it, but we follow the standard of using the higher limit, which is okay. the Correct. 266. Right. So you have the figures then? Yes, right. we can. We, we have them somewhere. Have them. <laughs> All right. But okay. Uh, Mr. Mayor, just for your edification, I think for 1718, the electric fund, we're spending $26.45 million in the depreciation fund. Um, and the other one is the water fund. Yeah, $6.58 million um, for this uh, coming fiscal year. That's on top of 28, a little over 28 in the current fiscal year, a little over 6 million in the current fiscal year. Sorry, one more time. The, uh, the 28.45, I'm sorry, 26.45 and 6.56. That's $32 million. In water and power and water, respectively. That's 20. 16, 17. That's the 17, 18 numbers. The 16, 17 numbers, 28.27 and 6.22, respectively. So in two years, we're spending about $72 million. Yes, sir. You, you have a, uh, uh, an obligation to spend those, those capital dollars that you have through the bond proceeds. So those monies have been coming in. They've been used. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, is there a motion for eight? Yes. Second. <laughs> Or this was for 8D? Yes. The initial motion was made by Council Member Najarian. We just require a second. Okay, I second. Thank you. Roll call, please. Council Member Zagajanian? Yes. Devine? Yes. Najarian? Yes. Sumanian? Yes. Mayor Garpetian? Yes. Next item, please. 8E is Director of Finance regarding adoption of fiscal year 2017 18 City of Glendale budget and citywide fee schedule establishing of new classifications and establishment of IRS Section 115 Pension Rate Stabilization Trust. E1 is a resolution adopting the fiscal year 2017-18 City of Glendale budget. Two is a resolution establishing certain fees and increasing certain fees for various services provided by the city and adopting a com comprehensive citywide fee schedule for fiscal year 2017-18. Three is a resolution establishing certain fees and increasing certain existing fees for public works, community development, and fire-related services permits and certificates. Four is a resolution establishing classification titles and compensation for employees covered by Glendale City Employees Association MOU and for confidential and hourly classifications. Five is a resolution establishing classifications, titles, and compensation for employees covered by the Glendale Management Association MOU, including employees relations exempt classifications. Six is resolution establishing classification titles and compensation for employees represented by the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 18. Seven is a resolution establishing a pension rate stabilization trust fund administered by the Public Agency Retirement Services PARS and establishing city manager as city's plan administrator. Eight is a motion authorizing award of a professional services agreement to Public Agency Retirement Services for participation in a pension rate stabilization program. And nine is a motion authorizing execution of all necessary documents with U.S. Bank for discretionary trustee services and high mark capital for investment management services. Okay, any questions or comments? I do have one item that I want to uh, bring up. I don't know, maybe this is last minute. We spoke about, uh, we discussed all the fees and uh, failed to talk about the ADU's fees because accessory dwelling unit fees. And uh, I received several calls and I didn't have the answer for them. The fees are apparently uh, kind of excessive, and that goes against the uh, basically the nature of the the ordinance that or the state law, and it was like twenty four, twenty five thousand dollars, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it's somewhere in that neighborhood, just in excess of twenty. <coughs> yes. So when it's all in, the entire amount. Yes. Right, yes. and this is this is the uh, fee for design review board. Uh, can, can you? I think that the, the, the driver, um, certainly, and if Phil can speak, would be the, the impact fees. Because right, those that's what I want to yeah. talk about. So that, that is correct. It's a little, we, we look at these as, as a, a residential unit. Um, we have a 
parks fee of about 19, almost $20,000, a library fee of $1,900, about $2,100. The, the design review, um, there is no design review because it's an administrative uh, permit. Uh, there, we have a minor fee of $258, I think, um, for just to make sure that it's compatible with the neighborhood. Your other building fees are approximately $3,000. So depending on the nature of, of that, that unit, it can be somewhere in the neighborhood of $25,000 to build. But that is, like any other residential unit, that we're charging in the city, um, a parks impact fee and a library impact fee. I, I think uh, this is where where the, I'm sorry, let me, because I brought, uh, if you will, uh, Mr. Lazafin, <clears throat> I think this is where the, where the, I see a little issue because $19,000 for a park fee for a 500 square foot unit versus uh, at 2,500 square foot or 2,000 square foot uh, apartment unit, which is part of a, a 50 unit development, I think it's not it's not a uh, it's not a right way of it's not a it's not a fair fair assessment because uh, I understand that these units can be r rented, but you're not changing the, the the title of your property as a duplex. So you're not adding a, a, a legal unit that has a separate address. But most uh, condominiums do. So if you add an accessory dwelling unit to your property for a four or 500 square foot unit, I, I think $20,000 parks fee is very excessive. Uh, that's what I wanted to talk about and see if, if there is a uh, interest to discuss this. Maybe you can put it today and, and uh, part of our budget, or if not, maybe bring it back and, and <coughs> discuss it in a, in a If I may, I, I do think it would need to be brought back for future discussion, and I know in, la in conjunction with Mr. Lansheim's update report on the, on the ADU ordinance, it, that might be the appropriate time to bring back. It's, it's certainly an appropriate discussion. The, the, the per unit fee for, the, for any, any residential unit is based on a certain standard, which may not be applicable w with respect to these monuments, but maybe some fee should be charged. And w of course, of course, of course. There has to be a fee for it. I understand that. But when are we getting a report back on ADUs? We are putting that together in conjunction with the South Bendo plan, um, not in conjunction, at the same time. Um, so we're looking at late fall uh, to come back. So September, October. I think we need to bring that back, bring that back uh, a, little bit, a little bit sooner than later. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Devine, then Council Member okay. Algen, um, Mr. Okay, I oh, Mr. I'm oh, sorry, I wanted to go first. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Najarian. Thank you. Um, I think many of us were contacted by uh, the, the uh, GCC professor uh, who was raising an objection to this, mainly based on the assumption that an ADU has the same uh, capacity or same population as a apartment unit, which is per currently I think at 2.56 persons per unit. So perhaps I, I totally agree that we should bring this back and maybe you can help us do a survey. I'm not sure how many ADUs are out there yet, but so I think it would be only fair that we get some <coughs> figure as to how many, uh, what is the occupancy of those ADUs and adjust, uh, adjust accordingly. So I think it's a timely issue as ADUs start to, to pop up. We want to be fair. We, the intent of the ADU law is not to uh, allow the city to place uh, ministerial burdens or unfair burdens on the process. So, so let's look at it, it makes I, sense. Yeah, I would just give you some food for thought and, and we'll do that and certainly your policy maker. Um, if you were building an apartment, you would be charged a fee and it's just under, I think it's 19,000. Um, because that apartment is, is having an impact you could have an apartment 600 square feet, which isn't much different than the ADU. So as you, as you think about this and when we bring it back, um, I would keep in mind that you will have people living in ADUs that will be using those and, and causing an impact. Where you set that is entirely up to you uh, as, as policymakers. So we'll bring uh, a range of choices for you. 
Ms. Devine, then Councilman Alexander. I, okay, I just wanted to say that uh, uh, the legislation for ADUs was uh, supposed to be an incentive for more housing. And so I don't think it's, uh, it would be counterintuitive to start charging $20,000 for, for a parks fee uh, for an NADU, and that's, that's my input. So okay. that. The same thing I want to add, mother-in-law unit, as they call it. That's what they call it, actually. <laughs> It, well, they call it in law unit, not mother. <laughs> in law unit. It, it certainly sure. sounds as though you all want to weigh in yeah. on that, and, and the fee that is there now is too much. We will bring that back just as soon as we can. Uh, okay. We will try and bring it back when, when uh, we're back from the summer break. Okay. Thank you. Is there a, 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 a motion? For I have questions. For you have questions? So, okay. Yeah. Budget? Yes. Still we are in budget. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I have a speaker card too. I'm sorry. Oh, Go ahead. Okay. We wait. Oh, if you need. Wait. Okay. Mr. Frank Gallo, I I, I got it right this time. Uh, my name is Frank Gallo. According to the proposed budget, the resources of the general fund will be increased by about 10 percent. In the meantime, the cost of public safety will be increased by about 20%. And this is not an isolated case. Uh, last year, the cost of public safety was increased by about 17%. And it has been increasing for the past 15 years. Public safety is the largest cost in the general fund, using 65% of the fund's resources. Almost any increase in the general fund resources ends up going to public safety. As a result of that, parks, libraries, public works are depending more and more on grants and federal funding. For many years, the Glendale Coalition for Better Government has said that these public safety costs are unsustainable. And those concerns have been ignored. In 2003, public safety was about 34% of the general fund budget. And that was in line with most cities in the state. Now, the cost of public safety is twice as much, almost. The city has been looking for resources to balance the budget from creating new taxes or increasing existing ones to using non-recurring funds or of revenue, like is the case of the GRA, the Glendale Redevelopment Agency, to increasing fees that, by the way, this year were increased about 200 percent, meaning that many single-family homeowners will likely waive or postpone developments or improvements to their homes. What will happen once you run out of Glendale Rede Redevelopment Agency funds, the now defunct Redevelopment Agency funds? What's going to happen? Would you be selling city assets? Why not? addressing the problem right now. Let's see what can be done about public safety costs. How can it be reduced? How can it be contained? Is it time to do that? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> okay. Any questions, Mr. Aljani? Yes. I just um, uh, a few questions. One is uh, there is a I think it should be page five. My copy doesn't show any page on it, but it's page five, I guess, where it says general fund resources. So total resources says, say, uh, 2016, fiscal year 2016 to 17, is 194 million, and some changes. And proposed 2017, we expect to have general fund resources of 215 million and some dollars. So we have increase of 20 million. 
Then we go to page, I assume, should be seven. Mine doesn't have page number, but where it says general fund appropriations. And in there, we see again, 194 is the expenditure and 2015 is proposed what we're gonna spend. And what bothers me is as if we have to spend whatever we get. There is no tomorrow. We spend everything we have. And um, it's like, I don't want to, I don't know if I can say, like a drunken sailor spends whatever it comes in. I did not hear during this budget sessions uh, anything like a department came forward and says, as a result of these measures, we have saved like millions of dollars or whatever. The other thing bothers me is there says overtime on the page seven and it shows seven million for last year, just for uh, fire department was 10 million. And I understand that there is this system that if you have short on employees, that money will go toward the, to uh, take away from that overtime. So it says in 2016, 2017 on page seven, there is seven million hundred fifty-two million, seven million hundred fifty-two thousand overtime for the entire departments. Whereas I said for fire department was ten million, and the future is eight million six hundred forty-nine, and of course we had overtime for police, uh, uh, public works, and others. And I have questions from. Chief of, uh, Chief of Fire, because I discussed with him and I want to be here to be recorded, if it's possible. Chief, want to come on up? I, and as the Chief comes up, and with respect to Mr. Gallo's comments, I think you, no. I would ask you to recall that when the members of the coalition were seeking to repeal uh, measure, and we went through the exercise of looking at contracting out with the county, because absent of contracting out with the county of Los Angeles, I don't know how you would provide public safety services, which when you talk to folks as we do and survey them, what do they expect from their local government public safety services? The idea that uh, you could contract with the county for the same level of service and get it for less money, um, I think was ultimately disproven pretty clearly because pound for pound, our folks are gonna be less expensive. Um, and so we were able to demonstrate that. We'd be happy, and if it's not on the website still, we can make it available again. But until and unless we're going to move to this, uh, this uh, reality where we don't need police or fire services, emergency medical services, I just don't know how you operate a city without any level of uh, public, uh, uh, public safety services. And further, when we do our surveys of uh, Glendale residents, what they want to see is a high level of public safety services. So I imagine we could cut back on service um, certainly, uh, but I don't think that's what is being requested of us by the public. And with respect to the question of, of the amount of money that is there in, in revenue, the amount of money that's there in expenditure, I would again ask you to think back to some of the transactions that occur within the general fund. We brought back the, collapsing the emergency medical fund, so we take those revenues, we bring the costs with them, and so you'll see an artificial in increase to, for those types of transactions into the general fund. They don't necessarily reflect a whole new slew of cost or activity that is uh, net new from everything else that we've had. That's part of the function of the last four budget study sessions. Um, I would also submit to you that uh, you, you hit on overtime. I'm sure you're going to ask the chief uh, a series of questions about it. But when you look at where this organization was by way of its budget, going through the Great Recession, the loss of employees, and still the maintenance, when you look at our deliverables of the uh, degree of service, and the request for additional services going forward, it's not a wonder that if revenue comes up, there is always something to spend it on because again, we decimated the organization when we had to and the councils previously uh, had looked at living within their means. I suppose we could try to, to deficit spend has been requested by the folks in the coalition uh, through their video regarding the budget, but I, I would submit to you that in terms of fiscal responsibility being your number one priority as a local government, you really can't do that. 
Um, but I know you have questions for the chief. And can I make another or ask an, one more question? I'm sorry, chief. Um, please. Uh, uh, let, let Mr. Oh, I thought he was. Oh, I'm sorry. No, you just yeah. asked the uh, chief. To come okay. Yeah. Uh, I just want to be the public to be aware of what I discussed with mm -hmm. chief. First, I want to mention Glenda Fire has been a class one fire department for over 20 years. I don't want anybody to say anything different or lecture me for what I want to ask. I just want to make the things better. As a council member, I have responsibility to those who elected me. So as I discussed before, uh, in here also, that a person calls and all of a sudden, seven people there are coming. And uh, to me, that we have to do something better. Because we get 19,000 calls, and most of them are nothing to do with fire. These other helps people they are asking. One being, I brought the example here, that a uh, lady says, oh, my heartbeat is higher, and seven people they are coming. And they ask you, I said, is there a way that we can make based on the call. Like if I say my finger is broken. So that we know, like I broke my hip. I was in the hospital for three days. This is the hip, not finger. And we know the person can wait, okay. Or you just send the person, like he doesn't need seven people to go to visit him. So I ask you, and I said there should be a better system, and there are tiered system, which we discussed from July. You told me that you're going to try to uh, start doing that. It means calls coming in. That system will tell you you don't need to send like a fire engine and fire truck or ambulance or whatever or police. So, so am I right? Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, Council Member uh, Agajanian, yes, you are correct. What we are in the process of doing is revamping our computer-aided dispatch software. Uh, the computer-aided dispatch or CAD software that we are currently using is, uh, doesn't have the ability to do if statements. So what we will be able to do is tiered dispatching. And when we can use tiers, uh, alpha would be a, 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 a very critical call, where a delta would be a, a lower tiered call, um, not as critical. And so we wouldn't have to send as many resources to every one of these uh, lower acuity calls. Thank so you. yeah, that, that is exactly you think that's correct. that's a better system? It's a much better system, system, yes. System now that we send a big group of people to visit the person. Uh, again, it, so what we're saying is anything that's related to a lower acuity call, like you say, a broken finger, we could probably go to a lower uh, tier. Okay. And that's, that's, that's... But right now we are not doing it. Right now, the, the 14 agencies that Verdugo dispatches for out of our fire station 21, do, we don't do tiered dispatching. We're in the process of getting to that. All right. Well, the next question I have, uh, every uh, firefighter or engineer, engineers, uh, you have 36 engineers. Yes. Uh, we have nine fire stations. Correct. In each, we have four. No. Each... How many do we have? It depends. We have three truck companies, uh, and then we have nine engine companies. So there's a total of 12. 12 times three is 36. That's where you get your 36 okay. engineers. The engineers are the ones that drive the apparatus. Okay. Now, my question is, uh, when one of those engineers in a fire station is not coming to work for any reason, then somebody should replace him, right? Correct. And he will get 50% overtime. He the gets person who replaced the other time, time and a half. Time and a half, yes. Yeah, time and a half. Okay. Now, uh, so the engineer who replaced him will be among those three which are in that fire station or will come through that 36 people who are it goes through the 36 people. So the person with the least amount of overtime hours would be first up to work that, that particular opening. So somebody will not replace him from the same fire station? Not necessarily. I see. Now the second issue I have. You give to uh, every firefighter and other group of people who work in fire station, they have this uh, schedule, right? Correct. A time schedule? Correct. It's called the Kelly schedule. 
Okay, clearly scheduled. And I ask you and that if somebody goes on vacation, somebody else replace him, him with time and a half, right? Correct. Why we don't do like, uh, this is computer system. We know the person when he's gonna go for vacation ahead of time. They don't come and say tomorrow I'm going for 15 days. Why we don't give the schedule we know this person will not be here like the regular schedule. Somebody else will be there. Why we are asking somebody else to replace the one who going for vacation and pay time and half? Uh, this well, is, computer will do it. Will tell you how to schedule it, right? You do with computer. We use a computerized system called yeah. Telestaff to, to do our staffing for us. Right. And what that does is it makes it to where, again, it's a system of you bid to, to work in the person with the least amount of hours would replace that person that goes on vacation to fill the spot. Again, because what we do is we, in Glendale we have constant staffing and the reason why we have constant staffing is because we believe that it's the best policy for public safety in, in the city of Glendale. We have very unique fire hazards in the city of Glendale and we believe that constant staffing is very important. No, my question is not, I know you have to have like four people in an engine. My question is that if I have to go for vacation. Mm -hmm. Why the other person who replaces me should get time and a half? Well, because I think at some point you end, you run out of people that that are have fewer hours. So what happens when the person that has fewer hours actually is sick and they can't come in? Or what happens? Sick on top of my vacation. I, well, I understand that people are out and a vacancy is a vacancy. So we can say we're going to schedule the vacations and they do but the world's an imperfect place. So somebody may have uh, a family emergency, somebody may be hold sick. On, so, well, no, hold on now, because if you're going, to, you know, it, it's, it's wonderful to say that for all these complex problems, there's a very simple solution. Unfortunately, oftentimes that simple solution is gonna be wrong for the way that we do business. So when we talk about, for example, I wanna make sure there's no false equivalency. You know, Chief, tell me how we handle somebody who has a broken finger. Tell me how we handle somebody who has an irregular heartbeat. Those are two very different things. Very different. And we are going to send everybody until this council, you say that, that you know, we, we have to send four people. We don't. This council could make policy and say, no, we're only going to send three. We're only going to staff three people on that engine. You could I do didn't that. say that. Well, but you could do that. So, but you're, you're, you're asking the chief. Now you you're, are. No, you're asking the chief. To, uh, you're asking the chief to make words. certain. No, you're asking me. the chief to make I'm certain yes and no answers that don't necessarily add up that way, sir. I beg your apology, but th th I want to make sure we're going to have an honest discussion. Let's have an honest discussion. That's not an honest discussion? Not what I'm hearing so far. Why? Because you're asking, you're making a false equivalency on one end. On the other hand, you're not appreciating that the fact that there is some degree of nuance between the way that they staff and ultimately what the realities financially are for the department. I would ask the chief, is, has, did, he balance, did he come in with a balanced budget this year? He did because he moves those dollars around inside of his department to make sure that he's providing you the highest level of service. You have $10 million dollars of overtime. But he has Thank salary you. savings. I want to finish my sentence. Sure. I've, uh, I'm saying simple question. Don't mix the issues up. Then we are not going to know what we are talking about. That's I'm the, talking that's about the truest the, thing that you said, sir. Okay, let's let, 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 let him. Go ahead, Mr. Algernon. I'll finish your, your, your question. I'm saying somebody is going for vacation. The vacation is vacation. I'm not saying there is an emergency. There is an emergency, somebody <laughs> will not come to work, somebody else will replace him. But if there is a vacation, most of the people, they, ahead of time, we know when they're gonna go vac for vacation. So we can arrange somebody else to cover that period of time. Not somebody else to come and cover somebody who's going for vacation for two weeks or whatever, I'm talking about like 15 days. I'm not talking about a day if somebody will be absent. So then we can arrange ahead of time and not to pay time and a half. That's simple. What has to do with other issues? You mixed up then with the issue the finger is broken. There is a tiered system which separates these issues. There is a tiered system which says the call comes in and the computer will say how many people they have to go and they're doing it. And now, uh, my, oh, 
Council Member Agajani, and if you would uh, allow me to answer the question okay, to please. you. So here's, here's what we had in the past. When I, when I first came on the department, we worked for straight time for overtime, okay? We were the, one of the only fire departments in California that did that. And I'm telling you right now, you can't compete with the other departments. We were a training ground for other fire departments like LA County, LA City, Burbank, Pasadena. We had people leaving in droves. They would work here, they would realize that in other departments you're making time and a half for overtime because that's the standard. Today, we have the, the standard and we are no different than any other city around us that has the same type of system where we hire back and we pay our members time and a half. Does that answer? Your question, is that what you were kind of referring to? I uh, just, uh, I'm so upset now with the city managers alluding to everything, not to ask you a question. Okay, Mr. I know you for s such a long time. I appreciate what you are doing. I have nothing against you or the, this fire department. I'm just trying to be a person who is prudent and he wants to be thrifty. So that's all I'm trying to do. There are systems outside that you can use and save money, and that's what I'm trying to do. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I have more questions, just, but uh, I just uh, don't uh, want Chief, to. Chief, if I can follow up on that. I think uh, no one disputes the necessity for the time and a half. I don't think the time and a half is an issue, if I, if I can use my own interpretation of what my colleague is saying. <clears throat> but the example of the vacation uh, with one firefighter replacing another one who's who happens to be going on vacation and yet being paid time and a half, that is somewhat strange. It's actually very strange, to be honest, because vacation doesn't happen the night before. It's usually pre-planned, well in advance. So uh, just like any other vacation for any other job, you make contingency by, by filling in with someone else. But it's just, you know, instead of you know, Joe, it's going to be John doing the job. And with, with the fact that you have advanced notice, I don't understand why it has to be the time, why, why, why it's considered overtime. It should be just regular time, just another firefighter should fill in the gap. I mean, it, 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 so there's, it's not an issue of why are we paying our firefighters overtime. Why are we, I think the question is very simple, why are we paying uh, those who are covering someone's vacation is overtime? I mean, it's just, just the job, it's just, I mean, it's not an emergency, it's not like someone has to be called in the night before and has to fill in the gap. So is what's, I mean, there has to be yes, a sir. rational answer to I, it. I, I understand, and, and so what we do is, we have the ability to overhire in our recruit academies by six members. And so when we have overhires, we take the overhires and we place them in those vacation spots, or in any vacancy for that matter. But again, all we're doing is, we're, we're, a, a vacancy is created, whether it be through vacation, sick leave, or anything else, injury, and we're filling in with other bodies. And when they're over hires, we don't pay the extra time and a half, or the extra half time. We just pay the straight time. Okay, so, so you're that saying make sense? If, if you have over hires available, Correct. You, will f you will cover the vacation with a straight time pay arrangement. Correct. Otherwise, you have to get another firefighter who will be paid overtime. So Correct. ten million dollars is a lot of money. Perhaps some of that money should be allocated towards hiring more of these overhires. Not not quite sure what that is, but it's obviously something other than a a regular hire, I, I assume. It, what we what we do is we overhire by two people per platoon. So that's six six extra firefighters. Okay. So when a firefighter goes on vacation and we have an extra firefighter, say, uh, on the truck that day, we'll move that firefighter over to the engine in the case of a vacancy to save that money. So perhaps having, instead of, you said three? or three, Two per shift. Two per shift. Total so of six. May, d d would, would increasing that number to three maybe solve it, the problem? But you have, one, you have to negotiate that under your contract. Of course, then there'll be a PERS issue. And, and, well, and two, that then it becomes, so, so you, we try to manage the overhires because now PERS rates are so high that it makes more sense to, to go and bring in the overhires, yeah. whereas before it was cheaper just to pay the time and a half because you're not paying PERS on, on the overtime. Well, so you, you watch that differential as it moves back and forth. Uh, you know, to the extent, again, that the, the chief has uh, vacancies, 
so when people are going on vacation, that is, is exacerbated <coughs> by a vacancy on the department. And to the extent that we have whole classes of people come on and retire, generally speaking, you'll see the, the, the uh, overtime kind of feast and famine. But okay. I, I think the takeaway, because I want to make sure that there's no uh, misinterpretation, he may go over on overtime, but he's making it up on salaries because he doesn't have those bodies for whatever reason it may be. So when you look at the chief's overall budget, he's coming in at 99% of his budget, not so, over budget. Which, which brings me back to the point of what well, maybe we should see a comparison of you know, adding that third person versus the way it works now. Um, you know, the full, full, you know, full loaded compensation package for extra however many it would be department wide compared to what's happening now with 10 million overtime because uh, you, you have to admit, Chief, it, it is a large number. It's a little not unpalatable to, yes, sir. to hear. I, what's the total salary package for all of our fire, firefighters? What's the total amount of money that we pay uh, in compensation to our firefighters altogether? Are you or talking about just for a single firefighter or the, no, no, no. the, the whole, the whole, the whole package? How much, are we, uh, how much are we paying? Uh, we're, let's see, we're, we're $53 million next year in our budget. I think we're... 58. 18 million? Roughly 18 million are salaries for, for firefighters. 18 million are yeah. salaries for firefighters. Uh -huh. How much so, is it? So how much is almost more, more than 50%. More than so the, the overtime, the amount of money that's being spent on, on overtime is more than 50% of that 18 million that we're paying on five. But again, as, as Mr. Ochoa mentions, when you have vacancies where you're paying that time and a half, you're making, you're making money on the salary savings. Exactly, and I get that. So it's that's a wash in the so, end. So maybe we look at a systemic solution, which is to add one extra overhire per platoon. Um, and, and again, that, that, that would numbers. be something that we'd have to get to in an MOU process because our MOU restricts us to six people. What MOU mean, meaning the Memorandum rank and file of the union has accepted this arrangement? Well, the city Sorry. council has accepted this going back quite a while. That, that was, well, the, that right. was the negotiation. A number of years ago, yeah. yeah. I was like, at least years ago. I think now we're taking a closer look and, and we're reconsidering that. I mean, potentially it, it, reconsidering It could that. very well be, but again, I, I, the, the, to the extent that, that they're in the personal, they are in, in the, the service industry. They aren't making widgets. The vast majority of the police and fire department budgets are bodies, are salaries, right. be because they put bodies out on the street and they put them out on, on a constant basis. So I, I don't want you to think that, wow, you know, if it's 90% uh, towards salaries, total compensation, everything, that's probably close, about 85 to 90% of those departments, that's what it's going to be. So you recall from our overall our organizational profile, we try to keep general fund overall at 75% of non-capital expenditures <coughs> um, is, is employment costs, our, our bodies. We're at 76%, so we're right there because we have a very lean organization. Citywide, we keep it, the, the cap is 35%, we're at 33%. So the idea that in, in the general fund in particular, most of the, the, the cost of the general fund are bodies to provide service, especially in, in public safety departments. I, I just have a general question. Of, of all of the, um, the vacations, do you use these over, overrides more often than others? I mean, would you say you use them 70% uh, of the time that the firefighters want a vac have a vacation, or do you rarely use them? Or, you know, just to kind of give us an idea of um, how... It ebbs and it flows, ma'am. I, I would say this. Um, when you have a, a recruit academy and you graduate the recruit academy plus six, you would have that for a duration until people start to retire or they leave the organization. For the most part, retire. No one's really leaving the organization lately because we're competitive with the other departments around us. So what we're seeing is you'll see that it'll, it'll ebb and then it'll flow and then it'll ebb and it'll flow and it'll keep going back and forth. Uh, so what we do is we try to always hire up as many people as we can so we have those overhires to fill in the vacancies. And so most of the, so all of the, every time that uh, someone uh, is taking a vacation, you try to use the... We, when we have them, yes, we will always use them if we have overhires. Overhires. Yes. If, okay. if they're available, we will always have them. We will not pay the overtime. We will pay that straight time. Okay. Councilman Aljani, are you back? Uh, thank you. Uh, if a little bit earlier, if I was... Mad? It was not toward you. Sorry, Greg. 
No problem. <laughs> okay. But <laughs> now, I have been elected here to represent people who are watching me. Indeed. Okay. I did not come here to see you play with words. And mm -hmm. I'm talking about overtime, and you're talking about going back to other issues. That's not what uh, I came here for. Okay. So, so I appreciate that, sir. I do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Do you have more, more questions? Let's let's. I, let's, let's I have something. This thing yes. Chief. Yes, sir. I want to apologize to you. It's usually not the conduct and course of the city council to play. I got you on detailed budget issues on the cusp of adopting the budget. Not that the questions were inappropriate, but the timing, I think, puts you at a disadvantage. And perhaps, I don't know if the police chief is going to be up next. Uh, and we've been through months of budget study session where I think we could have really dug deep into these details. And perhaps you could have brought the answers to many of these questions, uh, perhaps the following meeting or later in the day. So um, I, I hope this isn't a, a pattern that we're going to. Uh, that we're going to uh, continue with. So, uh, okay. uh, I, I think I want to. I'll, I'll give you a chance. Things. I'll give you a chance if if you allow me. I think we are just going to the wrong wrong path. Uh, I think what we need to do, Chief, is in July or August, we'll give you a chance to come back and bring all the suggestions that you have, all the plans that some of the issues that Mr. Agajanian raised and Mr. So all the council members raised as far as how many uh, on-field positions do we have. I know we have a budget because we have on-field positions. Let's say we, if we have 170 uh, firefighters, we have 12, 10 on-field positions all put together. It, it just balances the budget and we use their on-field positions for uh, overtime uh, funds. But we, uh, I'm asking you to please bring a, a, a comprehensive report back to tell us what are the, the steps that you, the, the, the department uh, can take to save some funds, increase uh, personnel, or whatever it is. Is it four person? Is it three person? Is it, is it uh, uh, hires, new hires that we have? You bring us that report so we can, we can make an educated decision. Uh, that's it's fair to the fire department, the GFFA, and it's also fair, and we can we can manage it. We, it's, it's digestible. It's a, it's a budget that if every department grows 20, 25 percent a year, we're going to be in trouble. <coughs> I know you are very fair. I know you you, and I don't think anybody wants to trap the chief today. I, I don't think anybody can trap the chief. So, uh, with that, <laughs> Mr. Asagajan. Okay. I raised the same issues. Now there was a concern. What I am bringing up this now. I raised the same issue, nobody supported me. And since nobody supported me to discuss these issues in here, so they came and we discussed together, okay. one by one. I didn't come here today to raise this issue. These issues I discussed with him almost a month ago. Since nobody supported me, any council member saying, okay, I want to hear that what is raising the issues, so I discussed it with uh, Chief Gray, okay. so Greg Sir. Fisher. Okay. And I'm very appreciative that he came forward, brought me some answers. So okay. that's why I raised it now that I have to, that I have to vote on budget. So right. don't we have to vote city adoption of budget? So that's why I raised it now. Okay, thank you, Mr. Agujan. And I think uh, you have the right to ask any questions that you want any time. Uh, timing can be a little bit off sometimes, but it's not a problem. We all are here to, for the betterment of this community. We, we are not here to just uh, go one versus another. This is a, whether we like it or not, this is a one big family, and we are all a, a member of it. So thank you, Chief. If there are no other questions from, uh, from Chief, uh, thank you, Chief. Thank you. Is there, a, uh, is there any other questions? Are there any other questions, comments? Is there a motion? I'll move 8E. Well, let's see. Can we do the resolutions and the motions together? You can. I'll move 8E 1 through 9. Second. The motion and the second. Roll call, please. 
Council Member Zagajanian? Yes. Devine? Yes. Nigerian? Yes. Sunanian? Yes. Mayor Garpedian? Yes. What's next, please? Mayor and Council, next on the agenda at F is City Attorney regarding appointment of City of Glendale members to the Burbank Glendale Pasadena Airport Authority Commission. F1 is a motion appointing three individuals as the Glendale members of, on the Airport Commission for the four year terms commencing June 1, 2017. Two is a motion directing staff. Okay, hey, Mr. Mr. Mayor, City members Attorney. of Council, the item before you is a uh, nomination appointment of uh, Glendale's three commissioners to the Burbank Glendale. Pasadena Airport Authority. Um, those seats commenced, the terms for those seats commenced are commenced on June 1st. So the current commissioners are still serving. Um, the only thing, so it's it's uh, within the council's discretion uh, who to appoint. Okay. I would just point out, um, as is in the report, the re most recent amendments to the JPA do allow the council to create, appoint, or create and appoint staggered terms. Uh, they are four year terms, but the council can stagger them and do two and four, however, however the, the council sees fit. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, several months ago, I was interested in holding a seat on the uh, Hollywood Burbank, Hollywood Bob Hope Airport Commission. Um, I do not seek a seat or an appointment at this at this time, uh, nor will I accept <laughs> the nomination of my colleagues. Uh, I would uh, like to nominate. Uh, Paula Devine for one of the seats. Okay. Um, Mr. City Clerk, do we have to take one at a time or can we make all the nominations and then take a vote? Take so just to follow the... Can okay. we make all the nominations at once? Okay. Just to follow the, the path of seniority, I'm going to pass my gavel and nominate Mr. Sinanian. And I'd like to nominate... Uh, Mayor Garpedian. I was going to do it, but yeah, okay. Oh, okay. Wait a okay. second. I'm going to take my gavel back. I, I would, however, uh, like to uh, call out uh, the service of former Mayor Frank Quintero, yes. who did a yeoman's job on the airport, uh, navigating it through uh, difficult times and uh, treacherous waters where only a, a skilled uh, diplomat uh, and gentleman at that as he is, could do. Um, he came out of retirement to serve on council. Uh, we forced him uh, to spend four years on the airport authority. Um, and I know he would very much like to serve a little bit longer uh, if he were given the chance. Uh, but um, I do have to defer to uh, any sitting, city, sitting city council member who seeks that seat. Uh, and I think we should put a recognition of uh, Mayor Quintero on our agenda when we all get back into town uh, later in the summer. Indeed. So thank you, Frank. We appreciate your hard work. Mr. Sinani. Thank you. And I want to um, add to your sentiments, Mr. Nigerian. Uh, I think Frank Quintero has uh, provided an invaluable service to the airport through a very long period of time and uh, actually has even managed to use the airport in, uh, to contribute tremendous, uh, tremendously to Eco Rapid Transit. Um, and he brought a lot of experience, a lot of professionalism, a lot of skill in navigating um, through the airport terminal replacement process, which took a, a while. And despite uh, many skeptics, had a favorable outcome. So I, I salute him and, and thank him and congratulate him on uh, on his service that he provided to the residents of Glendale and Burbank and Pasadena, I guess. And I'd, I'd like to echo that as well. Um, uh, Council, former Mayor Quintero has indefinitely served our city well. Uh, I am proud to uh, sit in his seat, as it were, and uh, um, I, uh, I thank him and uh, would like to say uh, you've done a brilliant job for our city, for our residents, our community, so thank you. Okay, yeah, I echo my, my colleagues' comments and thank Mr. Quintero for his commitment and dedication to our, not to our, our, our community and our city, as well as the airport and Eco Rapid Transit. I, I, I know he's been very instrumental on in that as well. So is there a, a, a roll call? A roll call, please, I say, is there a roll call? 
Um, is there a motion to move, uh, accept uh, all of the nominations, all of them? Move to accept the nominations and close nominations. Roll call. Okay. Council Roll members call, Agajanian? Yes. Devine? Yes. Najarian? Yes. Ryan? Yes. Redian? Yes. yes. What's, what's next, please? Uh, well, next is any uh, is oral communications. However, no cards were submitted for this portion of oral communications I, as well. I'll get you off the new business. I is like new business. New business. New okay. business, sir. business. Mr. Mayor, I move that the city attorney be and is hereby authorized to initiate litigation in a matter on behalf of the city. The name of the action, the other parties to the action, and the nature of the action shall be disclosed to any person upon inquiry once the action has commenced. Second. Second. Roll call, please. Councilmember Zagajanian? Yes. Devine? Yes. Najarian? Yes. Sunanian? Yes. I'm Mayor Garpedian? Yes. Anything else? I'd like to adjourn uh, tonight's meeting in the memory of retired Glendale Fire Captain Bill Dodson, an individual who gave above and beyond to our city. Bill passed away on Wednesday, May 10, 2017. Bill Dodson, a World War II and was the first of its kind in the nation. There, is there a motion to adjourn in memory of Bill Dawson? So moved. Second? Second. Thank you. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.